The board will not come to order. Madam Clerk, please call the roll. Alderwoman Tyus. Alderwoman Middlebrook. Prince. Alderman Bosley. Here. Alderman Moore. Alderwoman Hubbard. Alderwoman Ingracia. Alderman Coltar. Alderwoman Rice. Here. Alderman Gunther. Here. Alderman Vollmer. Alderwoman Martin, Alderman Ornowitz, Here. Alderwoman Murphy, Here. Alderwoman Howard, Present. Alderwoman Green, Present. Alderman Odenberg, Here. Alderman Rohde, Alderman Kennedy, Here. Alderwoman Davis, Alderwoman Spencer, Alderman Muhammad, Alderman Boyd, Present. Alderman Vaccaro, Alderman Ogilvy, Alderman Cone, Alderman Williamson, Alderman Boyd, Alderman Navarro, President Reed, here. Alderman Tyus, Alderman Moore. Alderman Hubbard, Alderman Coltar, Alderman Martin, Alderman Rohde, Alderman Davis, Alderman Spencer, Alderman Vaccaro, Alderman Williamson, Alderman Navarro. 19 present. Quorum being present, we will be led today in prayer by Reverend John Watson of Maple Temple. Can we have a moment of silence for the victims killed, those 12 victims killed in the shooting? Gracious God, Heavenly Father, we are grateful today that you give us the opportunity to come and petition you. For you have said in your word that it is of the Lord's mercy that we are not consumed. And we come before you today as a community, as a city, seeking your wisdom and seeking your strength that we can take our community to better places and we bring our minds and our ideals and come that we may serve the people, Lord. And we ask God that you would then recommit our hearts and our minds to, amen, to our community. And we know, God, you're able and you're able to do all things but fail, but we want to come, God, and ask for your strength and your guidance in this place and in this chamber. And to your hand, we commit our community, our city, ourselves, amen. Let's give uh, Reverend Watson a big round of applause and thank you for leading us in prayer. Uh, it's important to note that Reverend Watson is a member of the Church of God in Christ who has their holy convocation, they had their holy convocation here this week and brought people in from all around the globe here to our fair city. So let's thank them for bringing their holy convocation to our city. Let's give them a big round of applause. <laughs> Dispense with line item three, introduction of honored guests. Any introduction of honored guests? All the one from the 13th. Members of the board, I'd like to have as my honored guests, Keith uh, Taylor and Jeff Hans from the Carpenters Union. Thank you. Sorry. Any further introductions? All the one from the 14th. Yes, Mr. President and esteemed colleagues, I'd like to have for my honored guest, Gary Otten from the Painters Union. Um, and I would also like to uh, recognize Demetrius Alfred, Local 73, and David Sweeney from Lewis Rice. <laughs> Any 
Any further introductions? Any further introductions? Any further introductions? We, we, we also have with us, we are so very honored, Alderman Kennedy, would you like to approach the dais and introduce our two guests? Uh, Mr. President, members of the board, I've known women, rivers of women, blue, black, tan, high yellow, blue vein women, knitting hands, collecting eyes, ribbons, photographs, hair clips, poems and stories, stringing pearls and parables, tears and smiles, gathering picnic baskets, silk gloves, birthmarks, teacups and ashes, picking the flowers, snatching the breath prints of women past, <coughs> writing a song, women, rivers of women. I've known women, rivers of women. It's just a small portion of a poem by a giant woman from the city of St. Louis, Miss Shirley LaFleur, who is now the poet laureate of the city of St. Louis, who on her own money opened up a creative arts and expression lab in 1981 here in the city of St. Louis, who was a founding member of the black artist group here in the city of St. Louis that had both poets and playwrights. It had a theater group. It also included musicians. Uh, many of the musicians from the black artist group went up and left St. Louis because it's hard to be known as anything in St. Louis, went up to Chicago and founded what's called the Chicago Art Ensemble. They created this new style of jazz called avant-garde jazz back in the 60s. Now it's considered to be one of the stables of jazz today. Shirley LaFleur and the black arts movement were a part of people, what people considered to be the black power movement, the movement for justice in America. And these artists didn't just attend activities, they were involved in the movement, planning and operating activities. And they considered the black arts portion the creative end of the black power movement. And this woman is right here from St. Louis, from the Ville, grew up right here, put her bucket down here and continued to work. She opened up a creative arts and expression lab on Grand, which is now considered very artsy, the Arts Grand District. It wasn't nothing but a bunch of old torn out buildings of old Woolworths across the street when she opened up her lab. In that lab, she allowed all kind of folks to come up in to learn about how to write, how to express yourself. At any one evening, you can go up and see about 30 children up in there running around who she is teaching, not only how to express themselves, but literacy, how to read. She would say, you know, you can express yourself, but when you walk up out of here, you're gonna know how to read. You're gonna know how to write. On her own dime, she did this, committed to this community. I'm happy to say that uh, when I became alderman, she was a constituent of the 18th Ward, living in the 4200 block of Maryland. That's before it became renovated. She was there. Across the street from her was Moore Chong, the father of Akon, the rapper. He lived just right across the street from her. He is now being conferred as the National Director of the Arts Council of Senegal live right here in the city of St. Louis. And I'm happy to say he too lived in the 18th Ward. And so we have here a giant of a woman in a small body, a giant of a woman from this city, a wordsmith, some of us would say a word warrior, who can put words together in a way to make you think, to make you feel better, to cause you to stir up, and to even cause you to find the conflict inside of yourself and to recognize that even with that, there is redemption. That's a wordsmith and a word warrior. 
in the name of Shirley LaFleur. She went to Sumner and graduated from Sumner High School, as I said, from DeVille, and puts in her writing ideas that will cause people to think differently. She inspired others. If you've ever heard of the play called, uh, what was that, the, the Choreo Poem um, for Colored Girls Who Committed Suicide When the Rainbow Wasn't Enough, that author, Ntojake Shange, who is also from St. Louis, was inspired by Shirley LaFleur. She would call out her name when she would come to the city of St. Louis. This is the impact that this woman has had. Her part of the black arts movement and the poetry that she did is now today known as spoken word. It just didn't inspire these youth. They have continued the, the style of poetry that the black, black arts movement, the black arts movement was breaking all kinds of barriers. It wasn't just the rhythmic things of a Langston Hughes. They would actually write the poetry to look exactly like the word, the way people would say it. So they wouldn't say T-H-A-T -T like that. They say that. This is how it be. This is how it is. That's what's happening. And so it broke open barriers and made America a more congenial place to be, a more varied place to be, a more culturally diverse place to be a woman right here from the city of St. Louis that we now have accepted as a poet laureate for the city of St. Louis, a giant among people, a St. Louisan of great contribution. It is my honor, as her past alderman, it is my honor and longtime friend, I've, I've actually attended that creative lab, it is my honor to introduce her today that piece that I read earlier, I would like to claim that I wrote it, but I didn't. <laughs> it is her words, and they're moving words. And so we invite her here today. She'll be honored at 12 noon in the rotunda. But here she's come just to share a little bit of her richness and her expertise and her gifts here before the Board of Aldermen. It is my pleasure to introduce to you Ms. Shirley LaFleur. gathering. We come gathering across geographies, knitty hands, symbol of unity, blending heartbeats, a melody of unison, a harmonic conversion, celebrating the breath prints of our bloodline, stringing the gift of love like gospel pearls around our waist. We do this in remembrance of our heritage. We invite their spirit in honor of our bloodline. I woke up this morning with more than something on my mind. Woke up under a St. Louis sky, raspberry dust crawling the greens, where clouds sweat, blossoms scent sweet, cooling board like wooden hands, lay slavery dry bones with no more swan songs or dirges, black and blue. I woke up this morning with more than something on my mind. Me, Jesus, Franklin Avenue, Car Square, McLee Town, Sarah and Finney. I woke up ready to move on up a little higher. Oh, I want to thank 
St. Louis for honoring me as Port Laureate. Uh, thank you, Louis Reed and the Board of Aldermen, Maurice Falls. Thank you to the Poet Laureate Committee for selecting me. And thank you to so many dear friends and my family who are here with me today. Please stand to my ch please stand to my children, Hope, JC, and Lion, and my grandchildren, Noel, Jordan, Julian, and Bella. I am because of you and my parents and grandparents that passed on the spirit of the creative arts. Thank you very much. Congratulations, and on behalf of the senior citizens and all the community work that you have done through the years. Thank you so all much. All the way from Lafayette Town on up. Okay, so thank you. So we present you with these roses. Thank you much. I want to thank all of you very much for the honor to yes. that I've been bestowed upon me. Thank you very much. Would you like to say something? Yeah, I did. This, that I, all the hard work you done done in the community and activists all the way back from my repair and singing in the community and we go way back. And uh, it is well deserving, well deserving. So thank you. And thank you for all your work. And thank you, your beautiful daughter. Thank you. God bless you and thank you very much. Let's give another big round of applause and congratulations to Shirley for many years of work. And as Alderman from the 18th pointed out, uh, the formal ceremony is at noon in the rotunda. We'd love to see all of you out there um, so that we can show some big support for Shirley for all of her years of work and also congratulate her as the next Port Laureate for the city of St. Louis. Any further introductions? Any further introductions? All the one from first. Mr. President, members of the board, I'd like, are you doing special guests? Make sure. Yeah, go ahead. <laughs> Is it okay to do special guests now? Absolutely, Okay, yes. thank you. Yes. I'd like to introduce as my special guest, Sterling Adams, a, a resident of the first ward. And, and also a new member of the St. Louis Board of uh, Education Public Schools elected member, Joyce oh, Roberts. Oh yeah, congratulations. 
Alderman from the 22nd. Thank you, Mr. President, members of the board. I'd like to have my honor guest this morning, uh, Mr. Chris Pickle with AT&T, Demetrius Alfred with Local 73, and Alana Green, who will soon be our former CDA director, moving on to St. Louis Housing Authority. We salute her and thank her so much for all our hard work. Uh, all, all the women from the 8th. See, I don't have much of a voice today, Mr. President, but um, just on behalf of the older woman from the 28th Ward, I want to welcome the students from New City School who are up on our balcony. Thanks for being here today, guys. Any further introductions? Alderman from the 26th. Thank you, Mr. President, members of the board. I also want to introduce my uh, special guest today, and she left out, and that was uh, Lisa Gates. She's the uh, director of the uh, Financial Empowerment at the Treasurer's Office, and also Miss Joyce Roberts, like the older woman in the first ward said, uh, newly elected school, uh, school board member and resident 26 ward. Thank you. Also, just want to make sure everybody knows that the young lady that was here with, Lyle, with uh, Shirley LaFleur was none other than Lyle LaFleur, which is a internationally known uh, um, uh, writer and publisher. She's written many, many novels. So we want to, even though she's headed out with her mother, let's just give her a round of applause and thank you. Thank her for being here today. Any further introductions? Any further introductions? All of them from the 10th like to wrap us up. Thank you, Mr. President. Members of the board, we're gathered here on November 9th in 1620. This was the day the pilgrims first sighted land. Many people wish they probably would have turned around these days, but uh, <laughs> we, uh, in 1963, Louie Louie was topping the charts. But as we celebrate Veterans Day this weekend, uh, and this is because this is National Go to an Art Museum Day, why don't we all take this weekend and go to the new Veterans Memorial Museum? It is a beautiful thing they've done over there. It's a wonderful thing. And uh, I also have an update. The Alderman from the 23rd is doing better, but the stock and double butter microwave popcorn has gone down 40 <laughs> points since its operation. Let's get Alderman from the 23rd around. Well, I was on his recovery. Alderman from the, Alderman from the 18th. Um, Alderman from the 19th, would you like to make the motion for approval of the minutes? Alderman from the 18th for October 26, 2018. Uh, Mr. President, members of the board, I'd like to make a motion for approval of the minutes from October 26th. Second. Moved by the Alderman from the, all the women from the 19th and seconded by the Alderman from the 25th. Any discussion? All in favor signify by saying aye. Aye. Opposed, motion carries. Report to city officials. Re Report of city officials can be found in section A, B, and C of the agenda and have been placed in the alderman's mailboxes. We dispense with line item seven. Would anyone like to take any bills off of any of our informal calendars? Alderman from the 17th. Uh, yes, Mr. President, I'd like to uh, take board bill number 122 off the informal calendar. All right, Madam Clerk, please place board bill 122 on the regular third reading calendar. So noted. Oh, it's third reading, I'm sorry. Yeah. Would you want it on the third reading or the third reading? Uh, yeah, third reading's fine. Okay. All the one from the first. I thought we put it on the informal perfection calendar. Uh, so it would have to go to the perfection calendar. Yes, uh, unless, the, unless the attorney has put it on the wrong item. On we put it on the formal and perfection calendar, so that's where it has. So it's wrong. We did. Yes. If you look at the yes. previous agenda, you we will, will have to have a talk with the attorney about that and why he, why he has it on the wrong calendar. But it's on. But it, you're correct. It's on the third. It's on the that should have been on the perfection calendar. Madam Clerk, please make note of that and place Board Bill 122 on the regular perfection calendar. So noted. Thank you, all the one from the first, all the one from the 19th. And members of the board, I'd like to remove Board Bill 104 and place it on the perfection calendar. Okay. Madam Clerk, please make note of that. 
Place board bill 104 on the regular perfection calendar. So noted. So it's 104 and 122 on the regular perfection calendar. Would anyone like to take any further bills off of any of our informal calendars? Would anyone like to take any further bills off of any of our informal calendars? We've dispensed with line item 10, first reading the board bills. Board Bill 157, sponsored by Alderwoman and Gracia, an ordinance approving a blighting study and a redevelopment plan for Shoto, Jefferson, LaSalle, Missouri, Hickory, Mackey Place redevelopment and containing an severability clause. Board Bill 158, sponsored by Alderman Vollmer, an ordinance authorizing and directing the mayor and comptroller to execute a quick claim deed to Mary Jane Wagner for certain city owned property located in City Block 5054, which property is known as 3120 Alfred Avenue upon receipt of and in consideration of the sum of $55,000 and containing an emergency clause. Board Bill 159, sponsored by Alderman Williamson, pursuant to Ordinance 68937, an ordinance authorizing the honorary street name Von Versen Avenue, which shall begin at intersection of Hamilton and Enright and run east on Enright to the intersection of Goodfellow Boulevard and Enright. Board Bill 160, sponsored by Alderman Rohde, pursuant to Ordinance 68937, an ordinance authorizing the honorary street name Bob Gibson Way, which shall begin at the intersection of Gibson and South Kings Highway and run east on Gibson to the intersection of Gibson and Kentucky. That is the extent of first reading of board bills. Reference to committee. To the HUD's committee, board bill 157. To ways and means, board bill 158. To streets, board bill 159 and 160. That is the extent of reference to committee. Second reading. The following. Board bills were reported out of the street committee. Board Bill 150, sponsored by Alderwoman and Gracia, an ordinance recommended by the Board of Public Service to conditionally vacate above surface, surface, and subsurface rights for vehicle, e equestrian, and pedestrian travel in the north south alley, the remaining portion of east west alley, and the north south alley in City Block 2273, as founded by Union Pacific Railroad, 21st, Gratiot, and 22nd, and a portion of Gratiot beginning at 22nd and extending eastwardly to the portion of Gratiot previously vacated by Ordinance 65340. Board Bill 152, sponsored by Alderwoman Davis, pursuant to Ordinance 68937, an ordinance authorizing the honorary street name, Reverend Dr. W. H. Goatley, Jr., which shall begin at the intersection of North Leffenwell and Franklin and run west on Franklin to the intersection of T.E. Hundley and Franklin. The following board bill was reported out of the HUS Committee. Board Bill 129, sponsored by Alderman Williamson, an ordinance recommended by the Planning Commission to change the zoning of property as indicated on the district map from D, multiple family dwelling district, and H, area commercial district, to the H area commercial district for the portion of the parcel known as Lot A on the attached Exhibit A, and to the D, multiple family dwelling district for the portion of the parcel known as Lot B, in city block 5520 and containing an emergency clause. That is the extent of second reading of board bills. We've dispensed with line item 14, perfection consent. Board Bill 141, sponsored by Alderwoman Green, an ordinance pertaining to commercial semi-trailer trucks known as semis or tractor trailers, prohibiting such traffic along Utah from the west boundary of Grand to the east boundary of Morgan Fort Road, exempting from said prohibition emergency vehicles, including privately owned tow trucks, which when providing emergency service to nine commercial vehicles, vehicles making deliveries to nearby addresses, vehicles with a gross vehicle weight of less than 22,000, I'm sorry, 26,000 pounds and containing an emergency clause. Board Bill 149, sponsored by Alderman Bosley and Alderman Boyd, an ordinance recommended by the Board of Public Service repealing section one of, of ordinance 70524 and enacted in lieu thereof a new section one of 70524 in order to make technical corrections to ordinance 70524, which vacated subsurface, surface, above surface, surface, and subsurface rights for vehicle, equestrian, and pedestrian travel in certain streets, alleys bounded by St. Louis Avenue on the north, 22nd on the east, Cass on the south, Jefferson and Portnell on the west, repealing section six of ordinance 670524 as all requirements of section six have been met and are no longer applicable, and repealing section 10 of ordinance 70524 and replacing it with an emergency clause. Board Bill 151, sponsored by Alderman Bosley, an ordinance recommended by the Board of Public Service to conditionally vacate above surface, surface, and subsurface rights for vehicle, equestrian, pedestrian travel in the east west alley beginning at Salisbury and extending southeastwardly to the 20 foot wide north south alley 
in City Block 1174 as bounded by 19th, Malacroix, 20th, and Salisbury in the city. Board Bill 140 sponsored by Alderwoman and Alderman Spencer, Gunther, Green, Ornowitz, Navarro, and Ingracia, and Ordinance Amended Section 1 of Ordinance Number 62571 pertaining to exemptions from the Graduate Business License codified as Section 807020 of the Revised Code of the City by adding a new subsection 5 to Section 1 of Ordinance Number 62571, creating an exemption from the Graduate Business License for local farmers selling their agricultural products and products produced therefrom directly to consumers solely at farmers market and containing an emergency clause. Board Bill 141 sponsored by Alderman Colder and, I'm sorry, 144. Sponsored by Alderman Coulter and Ordinance Amended Section 2 of Ordinance Number 58267, approved March 19, 1981, as, and codified as Section 2086060 of the Revised Code of Ordinances of the City pertaining to candidate payments to the political party upon whose ticket he or she proposes to run as a candidate and seeks nomination 1% of the annual salary of the office for which he or she is a candidate to permit a candidate to submit said payment to the Board of Election Commissioners at the time the candidate files his or her declaration of candidacy and containing an emergency clause. Board Bill 145 sponsored by Alderman Coulter and Ordinance revising section 208120 of the City Revised Code of Ordinances pertaining to the Board of Election Commissioners preparing sample ballots so as to provide for the placement of candidates on said ballot in the order in which they are to appear on the official ballot rather than alphabetically as is currently provided and containing an emergency clause. Board Bill 146, Committee Substitute as amended, sponsored by Alderman Coulter, and ordinance repealing the first paragraph of Section 2 of Ordinance Number 66193, approved March 10, 2004, codified as Section 208330 of the City Revised Code of Ordinances pertaining to the nominating process for a nonpartisan candidate, and in lieu thereof of inserting a new first paragraph in Section 2, changing said process so that nonpartisan candidates may be nominated by a petition signed by registered voters rather than a certificate signed by registered electors and containing an emergency clause. Board Bill 147 sponsored by Alderman Coder and ordinance revising section 1B1 of ordinance number 59982 approved July 31st, 1986, codified as section 208400B1 of the City of St. Louis revised code of ordinances pertaining to the last date on which a candidate may withdraw from a primary election from 40 days prior to the date of primary election to 50 days prior to the date of primary election and containing an emergency clause. That is the extent of perfection consent calendar. Alderman from the 18th, you recognize on the motion. Alderman, yes, you did. Please, because I don't uh, know. <laughs> 144, 145, 146, committee substitute, and 147. I ask that they be taken off the perfection consent calendar and put on the perfection calendar. Right. Thank you. And that's, uh, Madam Clerk, that's 145, 146, committee substitute as amended, and 147. Add those to the regular. 144. And 144. Add those to the regular perfection calendar. So noted. 144, 145, 146, committee substitute as amended, and 147. So noted. Alderman from the 18th, you recognize on the motion. Oh, Alderman from the 3rd. Ms. President, I'd like to suspend the rules to put Board Bill 149. Yeah, uh, yeah, ma'am. Oh. You have to wait. Just, okay, yeah, excuse yeah. me. Yeah. Alderman from the 18th, you recognize on the motion for the perfection consent calendar. Mr. President, members of the board, I move for adoption of the perfection consent calendar. Been moved by the Alderman from the 18th, seconded by the Alderman from the 12th. Any discussion? All in favor signify by saying aye. Aye. Opposed? Motion carries. Alderman from the 3rd, if you'll wait until we finish the perfection calendar. So then I'll call. Board bills for perfection. Board Bill 122, sponsored by Alderman Rohde, an ordinance recommended by the Board of Estimate and Apportionment, authorizing the mayor of the city. Uh, hey, hey, Madam Clerk, uh, Board Bill one, 104. 104 
board bill 104 sponsored by Alderman Davis and ordinance enlarging the boundaries of the Port Authority of St. Louis of the City of St. Louis Port District and subject to the approval of Missouri Highways and Transportation Committee and authorizing certain actions in connection therewith. All the one from the 18th. I mean, 19th, you reckon? <laughs> yeah, yeah. Been going back and forth between That's the both okay. of you today. That's All okay. the one from the 19th, okay. you recognize on the perfection of Board Bill 104. Uh, thank you, Mr. President, members of the board. Board Bill 104 is. Uh, You'd like to make the motion for. I'd like to make the motion to. Perfect. Uh, perfect Board Bill 104. Moved by the one from the 19th, seconded by the one from the 13th. Please proceed, all one. Thank you. Board Bill 104 uh, was presented to us by the <coughs> Port Authority Director, and there have been a, a lot of discussion in the prior two years on how to engage our opportunities with the assets that we have. So uh, I'm thankful that that was proceeded to be a reality and Board Bill 104 was created saying just that, that we will look at the future opportunities to use our port and the entire port to bring economic development to our community and also uh, look at how we could beautify that area as well. So it just simply says that we will look at the entire port area from the city all the way to the city boundaries. Right now we're kind of operating a small area now just right by the um, riverfront base here. So I'm excited about this board bill. We took the opportunity in the last week or so because some people had concerns that uh, the understanding wasn't clear enough. So the director from the Port Authority sent a summary, of, I hope, of understanding, as well as uh, we also took a chance for those who did not attend the committee hearing. We sent that link to all of the board members so that they would have a clear understanding of the discussion in that meeting as well. So hopefully uh, we can pass this bill today, and it's just another step in the right direction for us to look at how we can improve opportunities for the city of St. Louis. All right. Any further discussion? Any further discussion? It's been moved by the other one from the 19th that we perfect Board Bill 104. All the one from the 8th. Thank you. Um, with the one from the 19th yield for questions? All the one from the 19th, will you yield for questions to Alderman from the 8th? Thank you. All the one from the 8th, please proceed. <clears throat> Thank you, Alderman. Um, so, I asked some questions in the committee and, and I appreciate the summary that was sent over um, and I apologize for my voice. I'm gonna try to get through this today. Um, in looking at uh, what is currently happening with the other Port Authority in our region, I think it behooves us to um, make sure that oversight into this, and we have all of the questions answered before we go forward on this bill today. Um, so I was wondering um, specifically, what do we see as the economic impact of, of expanding these boundaries? As we speak today, it would be absolutely impossible to give you a dollar amount and or a specific plan. All we're asking for is the opportunity to look at it. So they will have to come back to us if there's ever any decisions made on any type of project or anything. And we do also have a port commission as well, and I serve on that commission. And so any action that is taken uh, or, or would like to be taken has to come through that commission first. And so they're just asking for the opportunity to do a job that we've asked them to do, which is to look at expansion of economic development for the city. Um, so the, when you say the entire city limits um, in, the, in the bill, um, does that also, it, since, uh, since the legal definition, I guess, in here is, is just the um, boundaries of the city of St. Louis, does that also include the airport, the lease land there, or the airport land? No, we can only work within the boundaries of the city of St. Louis with okay. our port authority. Okay. Well, we had talked about a map in the committee, and we hadn't, we hadn't gotten a map yet. But that was one of the questions that Alderman Muhammad had asked, mm -hmm. was to see a map of kind of what the, what the Port Authority currently covers and then what we're talking about covering. I guess I just want to be specific about if it, 
if city owned land versus land that the city has an easement on, that kind of differentiation? Again, we have a port commission. We cannot do anything on any land other than land is owned by the city of St. Louis. Any project or consideration for any project has to come through the port commission. There would be no reason for us to, well, first of all, it's illegal to do something on somebody else's land. So that can never be a concern for us. And our employees are very astute. They know the boundaries. They know where our city limits are. And that is all they're going to look at. Nothing else that belongs to anyone else. Right. I understand that. I don't think that we're going to be taking property away from someone else. I just, for this body to understand what exactly that we're doing here, I think is... Um, it's very simple. It's very, it's so extremely simple. All we're asking is permission for our employees, the director, to move forward and exploring opportunities for our, within our city boundaries. Nothing else. I understand this, um, the American, or the, sorry, the Advanced Industrial Manufacturing Zones opportunity is a great opportunity that's come from the state. Um, I think that's something that we should absolutely be taking advantage of. Um, I just, with all of the concerns that are coming through the county right now, there's two separate Port Authority boards appointed out of the county right now. So in understanding the way that the city does it, how are, how are our Port Authority members appointed? Now, so your, your question is, who How it, appoints the members to the Port yes. Commission? Yes, that's my question. That would be the mayor. Okay. Does this body have any oversight over, over those? So do those have to come through the board, or is that one of those that's directly appointed by the mayor? They're directly appointed by the mayor. Okay. Um, so one of the other... Um, one of the other, well, you, you had said that if the if they were going through projects through the Port Authority, um, that you would first mention that this body would see those, but it's it's not my understanding that this body would just the Port Authority, right? That, that requires approval from the board, and we know what those are, if it has to do with expenditures out of our budget, those types of things. They do come through the Transportation Committee. Okay, mm -hmm. okay. Um, <clears throat> So currently, currently the, the Port Authority has control, has the ability to lease properties that are within the Port District. Um, if, if we expand to the full of the city boundaries, what happens if, there is, uh, if, if there's a city-owned property that the Port Authority wants to lease, but the city already has a lease to a, 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 lease, a lessee on that? Who, are, is there any potential loss of direct revenue to the city that would instead be diverted to the Port Authority by expansion of these boundaries? Absolutely not. And how any corporation runs or any business, you would never want to approve something that's going to harm you or take revenue away from you. So that would not ever be, I hope, ever be a consideration. So if you currently have a lease and or own a piece of property, why there would be no reason for us to negate that unless the, le the lessee is in agreement with it and it benefits all parties. That's the normal way those kinds of things are done. Right, right. But, not, but not arbitrarily. Right, and I, I believe that it is our job to be watchdogs before we go into this process to make sure that, that we know exactly how to that. We have a commission that does that. I understand that, but we, we have a duty to our constituents to represent their best interests as well. So this is why flushing these things out, I believe, is really important. Um, the, um, the next question I have is, so if, um, if we believe that they're acting in our best interest um, and we, we trust that the mayor's office is appointing folks um, that are, are doing their best through this, that's that's great, but we, there is a potential economic impact um, here that I think that it is, it behooves us to continue asking questions about this because the county port authority is mired in, um, in ethics violations or in ethics investigations as far as contracts being awarded um, because a director of the port authority gets to award contracts to sort of whoever they want um, through that process. And if we're, 
we are currently allowed to do that here at the city. The, the Port Authority director is currently allowed to do that. Um, we don't have any oversight as a body into that. And that's why I just, I want to be very clear about that. And in the summary that, um, that SLDC sent over, this last section um, I think is really important where it says, the St. Louis Port Authority will commit by formal resolution not to extend tax abatement to any company without the prior approval of a resolution by the Board of Aldermen. But that's not in the bill. Um, that's not... No, the, because there's no project in the bill. The only thing in the bill right now is asking for authority to operate and or acknowledge business opportunities all the way using all of our borders on the city limits. So there would be no reason for that to be in her summary. None at all. Because that's a process that's already in place. As I said earlier, if there is something that has economic impact, it has to come through the Transportation Committee, which is here and would have to be approved by the full board. Okay, thank you. I don't have any further thank questions. You. Um, Mr. President, I rise in opposition to this bill at the moment. Um, I would like to send this back to committee so that we have the opportunity to talk directly to SLDC, to the Port Authority Director, um, possibly other members of the Port Authority. We weren't able, I'm not on the Transportation Committee, I just happened to be there that day um, when this came forward, and the Port Authority nor SLDC was there to present this bill, um, and therefore um, we weren't, we didn't have the ability to um, ask all of these direct questions, and I think that um, it, it, all it takes is a simple Google search to of St. Louis Post Dispatch coverage lately to see what is happening with the St. Louis County Port Authority. They are taking in millions of dollars from the uh, casino there. There's a, there's a cash of about five million dollars that comes in every year, and they don't have to report back to the county council before they distribute that money. That can that's sort of a grant program that can be administered solely by the Port Authority. So that five million dollars, we don't have. We may not have any control if we got something like that. If, if we were to, um, if our port authority were to get that kind of money in, we don't have any oversight as the Board of Aldermen as to where that money goes. And if you all want to trust that the port authority will act in the best interest of all of our constituents, that's great. And I would love to have that, um, have that um, belief as well. Um, but I do believe that it is our job to oversee these types of things and make sure that the money is going the right direction. It's similar to, um, the bill that, that you yourself put forward, Mr. President, um, that if a long-term lease of the airport were to come forward, we would want to have a say in where some of that income would go. Um, I think that we have a right to ask all of these specific questions and see what it is the actual plan <coughs> going forward and how we can have some sort of oversight in this process. Okay, thank you. Thank you. Uh, any further discussion? Any further discussion? Alderman from the 24th. Uh, thank you, Mr. President. Um, I just want to make a note that the, the state statute uh, creates port authorities and, and gives powers to port authorities, authorizes port authorities um, to, well, let me, let me just read it. Uh, it gives them, every port authority shall have the right and power uh, to acquire the same by purchase, negotiation, or by condemnation, and should it elect to exercise the right of eminent domain, condemnation proceedings shall be maintained by and in the name of the Port Authority, et cetera, et cetera. So normally the power of eminent domain is the power the city has. It has to be authorized by the Board of Aldermen. Um, this creates a new power of eminent domain that the Port Authority would have throughout the entire city that would not have to be authorized by the Board of Aldermen. It would be a separate power that uh, just the Port Authority Board could issue. And so I personally am not comfortable at all <laughs> handing off that responsibility to an appointed board and, and saying I no longer have control over where eminent domain will be used within uh, my ward or any part of the city. I, I want at a minimum, our lo if, if we're gonna expand the boundaries of the Port Authority to the entire city, giving, an, giving a small appointed board all of these new powers that, that will be independent of our authority to, to manage them, I want to strip out some of these powers within our local ordinance and say, our local port authority cannot do these things. Or if they are gonna do these things, we require them to come to the Board of Aldermen for prior authorization before they do them. Um, these are important powers and, and you know, there's also powers of, of tax abatement and incentives that the 
state statute gives port authorities. We've spent multiple years here now figuring out how to, how to better manage our incentive programs. And now that we've done that and we've reached some type of consensus on that, it's very strange that the next week we would go and hand off all of these new powers to a port authority, which we really know very little about, I would say. Um, there may be some benefits here. I mean, there's a new state program that, that authorizes port authorities to collect uh, state taxes and withhold them and use them for, um, for incentives within, <laughs> for manufacturing projects. That's great, right? We probably want to take advantage of that, but I don't want to create all these other powers that we, we can't manage. Um, I, I think the prudent thing to do, and there's no, there's no rush on this, right? Whether, whether this passes two weeks from now or two months from now, it really doesn't matter. I think we ought to write into this bill some real requirements that the Port Authority uh, get authorization from the board before they do these things. You know, this letter, the Port Authority will commit by formal resolution not to extend tax abatement to any company without the prior approval of a resolution by the Board of Aldermen. They haven't done that yet. The Port Authority hasn't done that yet. And we can't, this letter is, is just paper, right? We can't hold them to this after we approve the bill. It's going to be at their discretion. So I, I want these things not in a commitment in a letter, but I want them they, I want them written into the law so we have a real commitment that they have to do them. Um, so I, I think we ought to just hit pause, fix the bill, make sure we still have oversight authority before moving forward, and then when we're comfortable that we'll have adequate oversight over these very important powers we're delegating to the Port Authority, powers like eminent domain, which we won't have control over, powers like tax abatement, other tax incentives, which we will not have control over, Let's put that in writing that we should have control over, the, over those things, and then we can move forward. I want everybody to just imagine, just imagine a circumstance in which the Port Authority decides to exercise the, the right of eminent domain on property within your ward, and you don't have a say over that. Can you imagine yourself being in that situation? I'm not, I'm not saying that's the aim here, but I'm saying that could very well happen if we move forward with this bill. And I think that's something that should, should scare anybody here, that that, with, with very little deliberation, that we're handing that power over to a small appointed board. So um, I stand in opposition to the bill as it is. I hope we can fix it and then move forward with a, with a bill that's been considered better. Thank you. All right, thank you. Any further discussion? Any further discussion? All the one from the first. Mr. President, members of the board. If the other one from the 19th will yield. All the one from the 19th will yield to the other one from the first. Yes. All the one from the first, please proceed. Um, so my head was down, and I didn't realize that we were going to be talking about the entire city. I didn't look at this. I thought the Port Authority, this bill was about uh, the riverfront and the 19 miles. Um, so what, why, what was the decision that was the reason that we needed to do the entire city? Maybe you can explain that to us. Actually, there was no reason. I'm going to put it that way. Okay. Because we already have a port commission, we already have all, all the, everything is, is operating. And you just simply look at other opportunities down the, the boundaries there. So technically, it really was no reason. I'll just say that. But uh, our normal operations and the responsibility to this board, you can't give tax abatement to somebody and we don't know about it and it doesn't come through here. So that's, some, that's how we operate. Uh, so that, there's nothing new here. Um, there's nothing unknown here. So, it, and it also, when you read the Transportation and Commerce Committee, it includes the Port Commission. It includes the operations and the doings of the Port Commission. Anything that has to do with funds, tax abatement, if there ever was one, I, I don't, I was trying to figure out if they've ever given one, I don't think so yet. But anything like that still has to come through the Transportation Committee and come for a vote through the full board. That's how we operate. The city operates on everything. So technically, they're operating the port. They have a commission. They didn't have to do this. But some people are very cautious, and I'm okay with that. 
but operating the port is operating the port, whether you do it in a small section or all of our, all of our boundaries for the city. But, okay, so I guess my question though, again, I have no problem with the Port Authority, all the places that we have ports, but mm -hmm. when you come over to where we don't have ports, mm -hmm. like you come over to the first ward, there's no port. I have a problem with the Port Authority in any way operating in the first ward. Mm -hmm. that, so I, didn't, I just don't understand what that necessity would be. The whole point of having a Port Authority is because we had wa waterways and the waterfront. So why would we give them any, um, uh, power in the first ward, I guess, is my question. Well, technically, they have no more power than any other department operating on behalf of the city of St. Louis. The rules are the same for all. If you are operating with a TIF, tax abatement, or anything, it has to come before the appropriate committee for approval and through this board of aldermen. That is for all actions. I have no further questions. Thank you. Um, I know that the president, when he first came here, I think you used to sit on the Port Authority. I was the chairman uh, of Port Authority. <laughs> many, so I, I keep taking these strolls down memory lane. <laughs> Been here too long. Um, so um, I want to support the Ottawa from the 19th, but I do not believe in enlarging anything where the mayor gets to appoint something mm -hmm. and I don't have a say to it. So, and, it, and I don't see, I think the whole point of the Port Authority was to have them take care of the port. Um, and in that I can support. When we give them expanded uh, authority, I have a problem with that because I've watched over the years, people start with very little things and then it enlarged. We, used, we started with gambling and it was gambling, you had to be in the river, then you had to be in the moat, then you had to look at water. So they take uh, little bit steps, little bitty steps and it enlarges to something else. I think that the Port Authority probably does a very good job on the port. I am not in support of them being able to reach out in any kind of way, even though there may be um, uh, things in place right now that would make sure they wouldn't do, th uh, do it the wrong way. That doesn't mean that we don't come back with something else a little later. And so I would like to keep the Port Authority in the port. And I'm not going to support this for that very reason. Thank you. Okay, thank you. Thank you. But, uh, uh, hey, uh, uh, hold on a second. I'll Oh, yeah, go ahead. You still have. You still have. No, uh, I, I would yield the older woman that's uh, carrying the bill, so that's what I thought it was. I, but when I read it, it says, uh, "Do you mind, I'm Mr. President?" Yeah. yeah. Continue. Okay. Continue your question. You Can still I, have the floor. Okay, but yeah. I had said, "Is it all right if I speak to the older woman from the 19th?" Absolutely. You all right. still, it, we haven't stopped. <laughs> okay. So when I'm reading uh, lines 16, 17, 18, and 19, it says, "Whereas on January 9th, 2018, the Board of Commissioners." of the Port Authority adopts resolution number 18 PT-2 recommending that the Board of Aldermen adopt an ordinance expanding the Port District to all, to include all the properties within the city limits. I read that to mean everything. Okay, so it, um, so I, if it's just the Port, I, but, then I think yeah. we need to correct that, yeah. to say that, okay? We could word it different. Right, so that's what I would yeah. suggest because yeah. That scares me when you say it's that we're going to do it for all the city limits, and I think that could be. It's never gone into any community <laughs> for any residential and or uh, business development. It is all about the port. Okay. Yes. So um, I might I suggest that we make a, a amendment to say. Okay. Well, uh, so I don't know. Is there any reason to pass this bill today? Do you need to get this passed? It has been asked that it be passed oh, today. Okay. I beg your pardon? It is, I would like to see it pass today. Okay, then I might suggest that we work on some, some uh, language that would uh, limit it to the Port Authority. Um, and mm -hmm. I can't do that without looking at the rest mm -hmm. of it now. So I have no yeah. further questions because I want to suggest some language, but I need to do that at a late while I uh, read the entire bill. I'll run from the 25th. I, I'm not sure if I have any questions if this is not pertaining to the expansion of the Port Authority to the entire city. Uh, I mean, that, I voted for this in committee underneath the impression, one, you know, that this was an expansion of the Port Authority <laughs> district for the entire city of St. Louis because that's how it reads in the bill. The, I, the boundaries of the Port Authority would expand to the city limits according to the bill. 
But the other reason that I had voted for it in committee is because, you know, there were some questions that were brought up, but we didn't have the Port Authority Council representation in the committee, but we were told that it, you know, would be provided to us, which still has not happened yet. Um, so I, I'm, I myself still have, you know, some unanswered questions that I would like to have answered, you know, before voting for a final vote on the bill. Um, but, you know, I, I, I think, and I agree with the alderwoman from the 19th, you know, having served on the transportation committee for most of my time down here, actually I believe my entire time down here at the board so far, um, when any time there's a lease agreement or anything along those lines for the Port Authority, it does come before this body. Um, so I understand that and agree with that, which is one of the reasons, you know, I think that, you know, the more tools that we have in our toolbox to, you know, create development opportunities in the city, it's a good thing. Um, but I do want to make sure that we have the appropriate oversight for those tools as well. Um, you know, I was under the impression that the, you know, Board of Aldermen was part of the confirmation process for the Port Authority. I've been uh, trying to search through the Port Authority's website, which is very limited in terms of, uh, you know, how that is supposed to be structured. Um, and actually it took me about 10 attempts before I was even able to load <laughs> the website for the Port Authority. Um, so, you know, at, at this juncture, I'm not prepared to vote in favor of this. Um, I, I would like to have more conversation at the committee level uh, with regard to the bill itself, um, just because I was under the impression that we were going to be doing that before passing it uh, anyway. So uh, that, that's where I'm uh, at with this bill currently. All right, thank you. Any further discussion? Any further discussion? All the one from the 20th? Thank you, Mr. President. Um, I'd like to ask the Alderwoman from the 19th to yield. Alderwoman from the 19th will yield for questions. Alderwoman from the 20th. No. Okay. Alderwoman from the 20th, please proceed. Thank you, Mr. President. Oh, I know, but yeah, yes, yes. yes. Uh, uh, unfortunately, uh, given that the sponsor won't answer, won't yield for questions, I'd like to ask the Alderman from the 24th to yield for questions. Alderman from the 24th will yield for questioning to the Alderwoman from the 20th. Yes. Please proceed, all the one from the 20th. Thank you. Uh, Alderman, um, do you have the bill in front of you? I do, on, on my city-issued laptop the, here. The way that it reads to me, uh, it says, the first clause, whereas the Board of Aldermen desires to expand the boundaries of the Port District to include the entire city limits. Uh, how do, does how does that uh, in be interpreted by you, Mr. Oh, Alderman well, the, from the yes, the, the, the clear intent and the clear meaning of that language is that all the, the, all the powers of the Port Authority, which are enumerated within the state statute, will extend to the entire 62 square miles of the city of St. Louis. So all, all the things they can currently do in their current area, which is, is mostly the riverfront area right now, they'll be able to do throughout every, every square inch of the city. That's, that's, clearly, that's clearly what is happening. Let's not have any confusion about that. Their powers will extend to every single square inch of the city. Do, uh, would that expansion of the powers include the 24th ward? Of course, yes. Would it include the 20th ward? Every single ward. What about the 5th ward? What about All the 4th ward? All wards would then be included under the powers of the Port Authority, if, am I correct? You are certainly correct, Thank yes. you. And according to the state statute, does the Port Authority have powers of tax abatement? They do, yes. Does the Port Authority have powers of eminent domain? They certainly do. And th let, me, let me just, let's clarify, those are, those are separate from the powers of eminent domain that the city currently has and do not, as far as I understand it, and if somebody wants to contradict me, let's get a real legal opinion on this, which we haven't had. They are, they are separate and independent from the rest of the powers of eminent domain of the city. The Port Authority is a, is a separate governmental jurisdiction. It's got its own powers, right, that we don't have authority over. So if, if they want to pursue condemnation in eminent domain without our approval, I 100% believe that, that they will be authorized to do so. Thank you. And does the uh, Port Authority have the uh, authority to 
levy taxes, sales and real property taxes, according to the state statute that gives them, grants them powers. They, they, they do have that authority. Um, I assume that authority is much like the authority for community improvement districts right now, where <laughs> property owners within the district have to generally approve of those new taxes. But yes, that, that is also a distinct and separate power from the power the city has. They, would you say the Port Authority has a large amount of authority, a, lot of, a, a large amount of powers? Certainly, the, the state statute is, is pretty broad in terms of giving them powers and authorities and, uh, to do a variety of things. Yes. And we've already discussed that the members of the Port Authority are whom? Do we have a list? I don't have a list in front of me, no. They're, according to the city website, the Port Authority is a seven-member appointed board, only six members of which are listed on the city website. Do we have a complete list of the Port Authority members? I don't, I don't have one in front of me, but I'm sure we could find one. What about the revenue that the Port Authority uh, has power over currently? Do you know where the revenue for the Port Authority uh, comes from? Well, uh, I don't have a full picture of that, but, but so the, the Port Authority handles leases along a lot of the riverfront, so they have lease revenue. I, I don't think their, their current budget is particularly substantial. I think it's only like a million and a half dollars sure. a year. Um, but one could certainly imagine that if we are expanding the, the Port Authority district to the entire city, in the future they'd probably have potentially substantially more revenue. Yes. And um, that is money that would otherwise come into the general fund, am I right? If, for example, we didn't have a port authority and those city-owned properties were simply leased by the city? Um, that's probably the case. We're getting to the point where I'm going to sure. have to do some speculation, so I don't want to, uh, I don't want to be wrong on any of these I topics. appreciate that. Yeah. So the $1.5 million a year or, that we're estimating is income to the port authority. Do you have any idea what that money is spent on? Uh, well, it's spent on Port Authority staff, and it's probably spent primarily on, on improvements to the, the ports right now, which seems to me to be very reasonable. Um, I, I know we do make improvements to be able to, to um, you know, to do intermodal transportation, to get goods off the river sure. into the city and to get, to get goods from the city, you know, to barges on the river. So, I mean, I don't have any... I don't think there's any particular issue generally with what the Port Authority is doing right now to facilitate, um, you know, transportation and shipping. Um, I think that, that, that's pretty easy to understand, but with the new state law authorizing Port Authorities to do more stuff, sure. and now us ex theoretically expanding the, the boundaries here, there's a lot more things we would have to start considering that they're do, doing. Is there any documentation on what that money is used for, to your knowledge? Well, I'm sure there is within, I'm sure the Port Authority has that information, but I don't I, have it. I haven't here. seen it. I looked on their website. I looked on the city budget uh, website. I was unable to find it. So if we do expand this and there is a considerable amount more of income going into the Port Authority, we would really have no idea what that money would be used for currently. Am I correct? Perhaps. Perhaps. I'm sure we could dig in and find it. Well, I do appreciate that. Um, one of the things that's of, of considerable note in the news, the St. Louis County Port Authority has been uh, quite in the, new, in the news quite a lot. There's been a lot of controversy out there. One of the things that has uh, really hit recently is that there are two now appointed boards, one appointed by Steve Stinger, the county, uh, the county executive, and one that has appointments by the St. Louis County Council. The Board of Aldermen currently has no appointments on our Port Authority. And this is a question I think we should explore, especially given the, the broad range of powers that this authority has over each and every one of our wards, including eminent domain, tax abatement, the levying of taxes, and the issuing of contracts without a standard city bidding process. And for those reasons, and I want to reiterate by reading the language specifically from the bill that the intent and the purpose and the result of passing this bill would be to expand the boundaries of the port district to include the entire city limits, which may be a very good thing, but certainly has been um, confused here on the floor of the Board of Aldermen today. And considering that is a major component of the bill and given that large amount of confusion regarding it, I do think it would be a good idea 
to send this back to committee to get some questions answered, to get some clarity, and to perhaps, as the alderman from the 24th pointed out, make some changes that will make, to remove some of the powers that could really be very disastrous for our, our city. Thank you, Mr. President, that's all I have. Any further discussion, any further discussion, any further discussion? All along, all along from the 20th. Uh, Mr. President, if appropriate, I'd like to move that. Yeah, hold on, for, uh, hold one second. All along from the 19th. Thank you. Please proceed. Uh, Mr. President, members of the board, I'd like to place board bill 104 back on the informal calendar. Thank you. Madam Clerk, please make note of that. Place board bill 104 back on the informal, perfection informal calendar. So noted. Board Bill 122, sponsored by Alderman Rohde, an ordinance recommended by the Board of Estimate and Apportionment, authorizing the mayor of the city to submit a 2019 annual action plan to the United States Department of Housing and Urban Development as required to apply for funding under the Federal Community Development Block Grant Home Investment Partnerships Emergency Solution Grant and Housing Opportunities for Persons with AIDS Entitlement Programs. Alderman from the 17th, you recognize on the perfection of Board Bill 122. Yes, Mr. President, I move that we perfect Board Bill 122. Yay. Moved by Alderman from the 17th, seconded by Alderman from the 10th. Any discussion? Alderman from the 1st. Mr. President, members of the board, thank you. Um, first of all, I'd like to uh, say that I attended kindergarten in Washington at Washington grade school and went to law school at Washington University, graduated, got a law degree, and passed the bar. My credentials were impugned last week, but it turns out that I did go to the hearing last night that we had, public hearing, and I was absolutely right that we should not be have been passing this board bill because we had not had a public hearing as required under the federal law. Now, I'm going to tell you what else it says because reading is fundamental. On page six, of the action plan, um, the second to the last paragraph says that the draft annual action plan was made available for public review and comments and that it has to be made available for public review and comments from October 13th, 2018 through November 13th, 2018. That would mean today is not November the 13th. It is November the what, 8th, 9th, what's that? 9th, I don't have, I know it's not the 13th yet. So. In the spirit of I was right again, and it doesn't make any difference what people who didn't go to law school and not a lawyer think of my legal uh, opinions, and the, in the spirit of 100% alderwoman from the first, zero from the alderman of the 17th who does not have a law degree, I am going to say we should. I will be perfectly fine with us uh, perfecting it, but we should not pass this bill until the public opinion time, which would be next Friday, and that should be when we do the third reading. But I don't get up and say stuff like this because, oh, I just want to mess with people. I want us to do things right and legal. And so when people attack my credibility when they don't have any of their own, I am being very nice and saying he owes me an apology, but he doesn't have enough courage to say that, but I was right. And Mrs. Green is here in case you guys want to ask her, because I was there last night. All right, thank you. Any further discussion? Any further discussion? Alderman, from the 17th, you recognize the close on the perfection of Board Bill 122. Uh, yes, uh, Mr. President, I'd like to uh, close with, I guess, several comments. One was, uh, if we would to perfect that last week, the intent was the third reading and finally pass it today, which would have been after the public uh, uh, session that we had, um, or I should say CDA had. And um, the older woman from the first is right. I am not an attorney. However, if anyone cares to, they can welcome to go out to CaseNet and look up the uh, alder, 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 name. Alder, alder, and you can alder, alderman, alderman, alderman. Yes. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Please proceed record that she has. In any event, I'd like to oh. renew my motion to uh, perfect board bill with number 122. It's Thank been, you. It's been moved by Alderman from 17th, seconded by Alderman from 10th that we 
Uh, perfect, uh, I, I had recognized them the close. Perfect uh, Board Bill 122. Any discussion? All, all in favor signify by saying aye. Aye. Opposed? Motion carries. <laughs> all right, thanks, Adam. Board Bill 144 is the one I have. Board Bill 144 is sponsored by Alderman Coltor and Ordinance Amending Section 2 of Ordinance Number 58267, approved March 19th, 1981, and codified as Section 208060 of the Revi Revised Code of Ordinances of the City pertaining to a candidate payments to the political party upon whose ticket he or she proposes to run as a candidate and seeks nomination 1% of the annual salary of the office for which he or she is a candidate to permit a candidate to submit said candidate to the Board of Election Commissioners at the time the candidate files his or her declaration of candidacy and containing an uh, emergency clause. All right. We have some order. Please proceed. Please proceed. Please. Madam Clerk. Oh, I'm done with Board Bill 144. Alderman from the 7th, recognized on, Alderman from the 24th, you recognized on the perfection of Board Bill 144. Thank you, Mr. President. I move we perfect Board Bill 144. Moved by the Alderman from the 24th, seconded by the Alderman from the 25th. Please proceed, Alderman. Sure. Um, there are four uh, bills that deal with various details of our municipal elections. Um, that we passed out of committee last week. Alderman from the 7th is uh, not here today. Um, I, I, I pity him. Uh, I'm having a lot of fun here. Uh, <laughs> Board, Bill, Board Bill 144 uh, makes a subtle change that just clarifies um, where the filing fee can be paid to. Um, and it clarifies that the filing fee can be paid uh, by the candidate to the Board of Election Commissioners when they file rather than to the Central Committees and then the Board of Election Commissioners remits that money to the Central Committees. Um, people think, candidates tend to think it's supposed to work this way anyway. It, it's some, they are sometimes confused by the fact that they are supposed to pay the filing fee to the political party rather than to the Board of Elections in order to uh, get on the ballot. So this clarifies that they can just pay that fee to the Board of Elections when they go to file, um, and the Board of Elections remits it to, uh, to the central committees. Um, and this is how, when one files as an independent candidate, of course you cannot pay to the central committee because there is no committee as an independent, so you, you sort of already do the same process. So that's the change in Board Bill 144. All right. Any any further discussion? Any further discussion on board? Alderman from 22nd. Yes, Mr. President, uh, members of the board, I sit on legislation committee. I just want to make sure that people are clear that the check is still made out to the, that committee, the Central Democratic Committee, the Republican Committee, whatever committee it is of that party, and is not made out to the Board of Election. They're just taking that check and sending it over to the committee. Okay. All right. uh, any further discussion? All the one from the first? Hi, Mr. President, it's my fault. Um, I have been told that these bills were going to be put on informal, and then they were not. So um, if the alderman from the 24th. All the alderman from the 24th will yield questions to the alderman from the first. I will, thank All you. All right, please proceed. Okay, just a minute. Which board? We're on 144 right now. And which one is that, please? Because I don't one, have it in front 144, of 144 uh, is the one that that clarifies uh, where candidates can submit their filing fee to when they file. Okay, and so we, is it for independent candidates also, or is it for, because independent candidates have to do the board because they don't have a party to submit to, right? Yes, it, it's for everybody, so, and, and the alderman from the 22nd made a good clarification. Let's say I go to file to be um, a Democratic candidate in a primary. I write my check out to the central committee for 1% of the salary, 37 or $370 or whatever, and I can hand it to the Board of Elections when I file, and they say, okay, you paid your filing fee, but then they send that check to the Central Committee. The Central right. Committee still gets, still gets the money. But that's, that's the way they've always been doing it. I don't understand. 
but it's not what the law says. So it's, it's the way The law that, says that yeah. you're supposed to write it right. to the party directly. Right. And so you're just putting an exception in to allow that you do it, what we've been doing all along anyway. Basically. Exactly. We're, we're making right. the law mirror sort of the what operations. What has been common of, practice. Yes, exactly. All Correct. right. Thank you. Thank you. All right. Thank you. Any further discussion? Any further discussion? All of them from the 24th, you recognize close on perfection of Board Bill 144. I renew my motion to perfect Board Bill 144. It's been moved by all of them from the 24th, seconded by all of them from the 25th, that we perfect Board Bill 144. All in favor signify by saying aye. Aye. Opposed? Motion carries. Board Bill 145, sponsored by Alderman Coltar, an ordinance revised in Section 208120 of the City Revised Code of Ordinances pertaining to the Board of Election Commissioners preparing sample ballots so as to provide for the placement of candidates on said ballots in the order in which they are to appear on the official ballot rather than alphabetically as is currently provided and containing an emergency clause. Alderman, from the 24th, you recognized on the perfection of Board Bill 145. Thank you, Mr. President. I move we perfect Board Bill 145. Moved by the Alderman from 24th, seconded by the Alderman from 22nd. Alderman, please proceed. Thank you. Uh, Board Bill 145 makes another subtle change to uh, election operations. Our current law provides uh, that the Board of Elections, uh, 20 days uh, before the election, provide a sample ballot to various people and they mail these sample ballots out and they do it as a courtesy, they mail it to more people than they're legally required to. Um, and what our current law says is that the sample ballot must list candidates in alphabetical order. Um, as we know, candidates do not appear on the real ballot in alphabetical order, they appear on the ballot in the order they filed or based on the lottery if you file the first day. So this, this bill would, would change the local law to say that the sample ballots they mail out, which they will still mail out to the same people, should list candidates in the actual order they will appear on the real <coughs> ballot. So the confusion comes in, uh, the Board of Elections posts the ballots online ahead of time uh, when they're finalized, and what they post online <laughs> is essentially the real ballot. It has everything in the correct, in the order it's gonna appear in the real ballot, but then right now they're required to mail something out to people with, with candidates in alphabetical order and that confuses people sometimes. So this just says the sample ballots they have to mail out will be listed in the same order as the real ballot. All right. Oh, from the first. President, members of the board, so I actually know why they did that, okay? Because the board did not want to give the appearance that they were giving a ballot out and suggesting in any order who should be voted on, okay? so they. They did this whew, back in the 90s, since it, or maybe early 80s, late, late 80s. But anyway, so they actually do have to sit, uh, post an actual real ballot the way it appears. But in sending out a sample ballot, they wanted to avoid all appearance of impropriety that they were somehow saying that this is who you should be for. And the person who is listed first often gets a bump or last, because people will often go uh, to the first person or to the last person to, uh, to vote. And so in order to try to level things out, that's why they made it so that they didn't do it in the exact order of the ballot, okay? That was the whole reason before that. Um, and I thought that was a pretty fair way of kind of evening out whatever was going on. For that reason, I'm not going to vote for this. I think it's a better way, and I think that you will see uh, that you will, if you go look at years and years and years of voting, that the first person on the ballot and the last person on the ballot are the people who gets the bumps all the time. And so uh, I, I, I uh, commend the Board of Election for trying not to be in the middle of partisan politics. All right. Like that. Thank so I ask you. for a roll call. All right, thank you. Any further discussion? Any further discussion? Alderman from the 24th, you recognize the close on Board Bill 145. Thank you. I renew my motion to perfect Board Bill 145. It's been moved by the Alderman from the 24th, seconded by the Alderman from the 22nd, that we perfect Board Bill 145. There's been a request for roll call. Madam Clerk, please call the roll. Alderman Tyus? No. Alderman Middlebrook? No. Alderman Bosley? No. Alderman Moore? No. Alderman Hubbard? No. Alderman Ingracia? Alderman Coltar, 
Alderman Rice? Aye. Alderman Gunther? Aye. Alderman Vollmer? Aye. Alderman Martin? Aye. Alderman Ornowitz? Aye. Alderman Murphy? Aye. Alderman Howard? Alderman Green? Alderman Odenberg? Alderman Rohde? Aye. Alderman Kennedy? Aye. Alderman Davis? Aye. Alderman Spencer? Aye. Alderman Muhammad? No. Alderman Boyd? Aye. Alderman Vaccaro? Alderman Ogilvy? Aye. Alderman Cohn? Aye. Alderman Williamson? Aye. Alderman Boyd? Aye. Alderman Navarro? Aye. President Reed? Alderman Middlebrook. Alderman Kotar. Alderman Howard. Alderman, I'm sorry, Alderman Navarro. I'm sorry, Alderman Vaccaro. Alderman Navarro. 21 I votes and four no votes. By vote, you stay in the motion, Alderman, from the 24th and perfected board bill. 145. Board Bill 146, Committee Substitute as amended, sponsored by Alderman Kotar, an ordinance repealing the first paragraph of Section 2 of Ordinance Number 66193, approved March 10, 2004, codified as Section 208330 of the City Revised Code of Ordinances pertaining to the nominating process for a nonpartisan candidate and in lieu thereof inserting a new paragraph in Section 2, changing said process so that nonpartisan candidates may be nominated by a petition signed by registered voters rather than a certificate signed by registered electors and containing an emergency clause. All of them from the 24th, you recognize on a professional board bill 146 committee substitute as amended. Thank you, Mr. President. I move we perfect board bill 146 committee substitute okay. as moved amended. By the, moved by all of them from the 24th, seconded by all of them from the 22nd. Please proceed. All right, I had a little too much coffee this morning. I'm gonna to try to slow down on this one because this, this, this is a subtle one. Uh, some of us in the room have, have been through this. Um, this one deals with the number of signatures required to get on the ballot as an independent candidate. Um, the current law basically only talks about citywide candidates and it says 2% it says you need to collect signatures from 2% of the votes cast in the last mayoral election, which makes sense. If you want to be on the ballot citywide, you should get 2% of the votes cast for the whole city. Let's say there's 20,000 votes cast for mayor or something. That amounts to uh, 400 signatures, right? But the current law doesn't... Um, say anything in particular about elections for aldermen. So if you just read the letter of the law, the letter of the law suggests that a candidate for aldermen should also have to go out and get as many signatures as a candidate for citywide office would have to get. Um, and if you follow the letter of the law, that's a lot of signatures for somebody running for aldermen. This bill would clarify that to say that if you want to be on the ballot as an alderman, as an independent candidate, you get 2% of the signatures of the ballots cast for mayor within your ward in the last mayor election. Now, I, I hear the alderman for the first say that's the way they do it, and this is generally been the way that the Board of Elections has been administering the law. It's the way they did it when I ran as an independent candidate in 2011. I got 2% of the signatures the ballots cast within the ward. Um, but it's not what the law says, right? And so now people have been saying, hey, there is an inconsistency in how, the, in how the law is written and how the Board of Elections has been administering the law. So I think this is a good, a good change because it clarifies things. It harmonizes what the Board of Elections has been doing with, um, with what the law should say, and it does not present an additional hurdle for um, independent candidates to get on the ballot. We, we, 
we're not trying to make it harder for anybody to get on the ballot. And in fact, we're trying to make sure independent candidates have access to the ballot, um, even though the, the law right now is a, is a little vague. So that is, that's the change. I'm happy to answer any questions or, or clarify this uh, because it is, it, it, it's very specific now on how we should do this. <coughs> All right. Any further discussion? Any further discussion? Alderman from the 21st. Hey, thank you, Mr. President. Uh, with the Alderman from the 24th, yield for questions. Alderman from the 24th, the yield to the Alderman from the 21st. Yes. Alderman from the 21st, please proceed. Thank you, Alderman. I'm a little slow here. I'm trying to understand and follow this. Uh, I really don't get it. What exactly are you doing? What's the point of this legislation? So the, the point is, I'm going to use some, some made-up numbers, but the made-up numbers are close to reality, right? I ran as an independent candidate in 2011, and some other members of the board have initially run as independent candidates. The way the law read, I would have been required to get something like 400 signatures of registered voters to get on the, on the ballot because it said 2% of all the votes cast in the last mayoral election. 400 signatures, I, I think, is a, it would be a big hurdle for just an alderman to get those signatures to get on the ballot to run for alderman. I think it's an, it's an appropriate number for somebody running citywide. You want to be on the ballot citywide, you ought to demonstrate some level of support throughout the city. Um, but it's too high for an alderman. So what this says is if you want to be on the ballot as an independent running for alderman, you just get 2% of the signatures of votes cast within your ward in the last mayoral election, and that's a lower number. That might only be, you know, 30, 40 signatures. And that, and what we are, the change in the law is actually how the Board of Elections has been administering this um, so far, because right now the law is not, it does not specifically say what the requirement is for independent candidates running for aldermen. And now we're making that specific. I also want to point out, look at us. We have almost the same tie-on. What a, what, a, what a great day. Alderman from the 21st and I. <laughs> Alderman, I stand in opposition. I think that this basically encourages low voter turnout because you're allowing an independent who's in historically democratic wars to run for Alderman. And I think that if they need, if, if, if it's a struggle for them to get less than 400 votes, that says something about the electoral process here, that says something about committee people and individual wars, and it also says something about the Democratic Party uh, in this city. I, it encourages low voter turnout to me. Uh, and, and there's no real, I mean, I don't, I don't get it, Alderman. I, I, I don't get it. I see several bills been introduced changing certain codes uh, about elections, and I, I don't get any one of them. All of them are redundant to me, how it seems. Uh, I'm a little new here, so you have to be patient with me. Uh, but you are making it easier for an independent to run in a democratic city. No, but I, I would say we're doing is we're making the law uh, parallel specifically how the Board of Elections has been doing this in the past. So the, the law will now say what, the, the law will now be the same as the Board of Elections has been administering the process. Currently, the law just doesn't really specify what the number of signatures is for an independent candidate for alderman. And you know, and I would say we want, election law has to be neutral in respect to party. Right? It can't favor one party over another party. But I would also say it's in the interest of the city to have competitive elections and to have choice on the, on the ballot for people. Um, and so we don't want to create, there is no primary for independent candidates because there is no party. So they need a way to get access to the ballot and this, this specifies exactly how independent candidates get access to the ballot. And I, I would say that leads to more competitive elections, which probably means higher turnout, uh, honestly. 
competitive elections now in March. General elections are in April. I think those are competitive. A again, I just think that this makes it easier for an independent to run, and I'm trying to understand the benefit of it, and I I'm not getting it. Well, I would say two responses. I would say I don't know what the problem is with an independent running, <laughs> first of all. But second of all, I would say uh, that right now we have an unclear law. We have a law that's vague, and we're trying to make the, and we're trying to make the law more clear so that there's no ambiguity in how the law works. I don't, I don't have a problem with independent running either, but when independents run, here in the Board of Aldermen, you've been one, when independents run, they get elected, then they join the Democratic Party. Uh, that is, no, that is the case. That's what, that's what I'm saying. Are, are you a member of the Democratic Party now? Yes. And you ran as an independent? I did. The other woman from the 15th Ward ran as an independent? She did. And she's a member of the Democratic Party? Mm-hmm. Also serves on the state committee, I believe. Oh, excuse me. She serves on the National Democratic Committee, but she ran as an independent. Why not just run as a Democrat? We're making it easier for independents to run. They get elected and they join the Democratic Party. To me, that undermines the Democratic Central Committee, and that undermines the Democratic uh, uh, process as it relates to electing Democrats uh, who run as Democrats. I have no further questions. Mr. President, I still stand in opposition. Alderman from the 25th. Thank you, Mr. President. Um, I, I would like to start by saying on the surface, I, I don't disagree with the intent of this bill. Um, you know, it is uh, frustrating as someone from the outside of St. Louis. I, you know, I got my start in the neighborhood, you know, with my ward organization when I first moved into the neighborhood. Um, I never ran for committee man or committee woman. Um, but generally speaking, when there are vacancies to be filled down here at the Board of Aldermen, um, it is not the most transparent process for replacement of, uh, of this body. Um, generally speaking, that's done through the Democratic Central Committee. Um, there is no open election process to determine who the Democratic candidate is going to be on that, uh, that special election ballot. Um, it's determined you know, exclusively by the representatives of the Democratic Party, which you know, I don't necessarily have an issue with per se, um, as that's the reason why they're elected to serve the Democratic Party, is to provide, um, I guess, advice and counsel when those types of openings occur. My, my concern with changing this, and you know, to the alderman of the 24th point, um, you know, providing more clarity to the BOE, the Board of Elections, uh, with regard to how to administer this rule, um, you know, if we're going to actually change the rule, then let's maybe look at how to change the rule. You know, currently, you know, currently, you know, if we're basing this off of, you know, the last mayoral election, you know, uh, Mr. President, may I inquire of the alderman from the 24th Ward? Alderman from the 24th, will you yield the question to alderman from the 25th? Yes. Alderman from the 25th, please proceed. Thank you. Uh, the alderman from the 24th used to be my roommate. I hope he uh, considers me a friend still. Um, but I do, do you know the, the turnout in the last mayoral election, what the percentage was for the turnout? Uh, I, it, I mean, I guess it was probably 15. I know it wasn't high. So uh, I, I have the Board of Elections website up. It was about uh, 20%. Do you know what the turnout was for the 2015 election for president of the Board of Aldermen? In the general? In the general election. It was probably quite low, I'm going to guess. It was under 10%. Right. So, you know, if we're going to look at how we're determining this rule moving forward, as everyone at this body knows, you know, the odd wards are up at the same time as the mayor, the even wards are up at the same time as the president of the Board of Aldermen. Um, there's significantly more votes cast in a mayoral general election consistently, all the time. There's more you know, ballots cast for a mayor uh, and the odd ward aldermen than there are for the even ward aldermen just because of turnout. So you're, re you're expecting half of this body to then go out and collect signatures for a turnout that's sometimes twice or triple 
the amount of turnout during their, you know, normal election cycle. So you're shaking your head no, but the, so the even wards are going out and collecting votes based off of the President Board of Aldermen's last race. They're collecting 2% of the ballots cast in the last mayoral election. That's what I'm saying. So in the last mayoral election, we had, you know, 20% turnout, over 20% turnout. So, and your ward was not up for election during that turnout, right? So in your ward, uh, you know, the turnout, I didn't look at those numbers, but if you're expecting someone to, let's say there were, uh, and I can speak to my ward. So in the 25th ward during that election, uh, you know, the mayor's race had 1,100 votes. In the 24th ward, there were 2,800 votes cast, you know, for the mayor's race in the general election. Uh, in 2015, let me pull that up. In 2015, the 24th Ward pulled in, did they take down the ward by ward they did? So in 2015 though, it would stand to reason that there weren't 2,200 votes cast for the President Board of Aldermen. Are you asking a question? Yeah. I, I think respectfully, I think you're misreading this. It's the same standard for everybody, regardless of what we're I, I know it's, what it's I know what it says. It's the same standard for everyone, but the standard then becomes higher for those who are in a lower voter turnout season. So all of the even ward candidates have a higher threshold to meet in terms of collecting signatures, you know, because their elections are significantly lower turnout. So if you're looking at doing so. You know, I don't, I'm, if we're going to change the rule now, you know, why aren't we changing the rule to reflect, you know, the election cycle in which they're running? So if it's based off of, you know, if you're up at the same time as the mayor's race, then sure, you know, have the signatures collected based off of the last time the mayor's race took place. If it's, you're up at the same time as the president board of aldermen's race, then have it based off of the president of the board of aldermen's turnout. That would clearly be illegal to set two different standards for how you get on the ballot for There's two different, different election cycles. That's, no. That, so, I think. It would not be illegal. It's two different election cycles. It's currently in our, that's like saying that we shouldn't have two different, that the evens and odds shouldn't be on two different election cycles. You can't, you can't tell, that would be like saying if you're running in, in an even year, you pay $200 to get on the ballot. If you're running in an odd year, you pay $600 to get in the ballot. You can't, you can't have two different standards to access the ballot for the same position. So what, I, what I'm saying is, first of all, this is not a high threshold. This is an accessible threshold for candidates to have access to the ballot. Second of all, it's what we're already doing, and it's what we've been doing for a long time. And I don't, nobody has seemed to complain about how we've been doing this for a long time. We're just making the law say the thing that we are actually already doing. And third of all, I, I, I don't follow this idea that it's like a different standard. It's the same standard. It's the vote, it's 2% of the votes cast in your ward in the last mayoral election. So that's not gonna be that high for anybody. It's gonna be accessible for, every, for everybody whether it's you know, 30 signatures or 60 signatures or whatever, it's not that high. What, what we're trying to do is make sure people don't have to, if you're just running for aldermen, we're trying to make sure you don't have to go and get the 2% of the votes cast throughout the whole city just to get access to run for aldermen because that's what the law sort of says right now. Even I'm doing that now. Even though it's vague. Right, but the law is not clear. We have a vague law that we are trying to make specific so that we avoid a situation in the future where somebody challenges this and says somebody shouldn't be on the ballot because the law is vague. We want specificity in the law and how you access the ballot so we don't have confusion and you know legal issues about who should have been on a ballot and who shouldn't. I agree with that. I don't disagree with that at all. Um, but I do think that it puts a higher burden on people running in an even ward, you know, when there's a higher turnout during the odd ward election cycle. 
I, I just respectfully, dis so my, my response would be, do you have an issue with how we're doing it now? Because how we're doing it now is what the law says, one. And two, <laughs> is it really that high a threshold? I don't think the threshold is that high. I think it's a very modest threshold. Um, I would I say that good. I'm not okay with the way things are done now because I don't feel like it's a very transparent process for people to run for democratic office in the city of St. Louis, that it's very much closed knit. Um, so you're not going, I, I'm not going to say that I'm comfortable with the way things are right now. Um, but in terms of this particular part of the process, um, I, I believe that we could be doing better. Okay. So I, I appreciate your perspective on that and I, I rest, Mr. President. All the one from Nath. Thank you, Mr. President. I just want to address um, part of uh, the alderman from the, um, from the 25th <laughs> um, concerns here. Um, one, of, one of the things about running as an independent candidate that um, all, the alderman from the 15th had to do was not only run in a special election, but then run in an off-year election for her own general, right? So the 15th is on the odd cycle, um, which is paired up with the mayor, um, but she also had to run on the even cycle because of when she was elected. So you have to run on, in a special and then run again in the first regularly scheduled general. So someone who is running as an independent, I, I did not have to do that because the next cycle up for myself after this special election is the regularly scheduled even numbered election. Um, so, and I think, um, I understand your concern that it's, that they are two different sets of turnout numbers, um, but they, this, uh, the alderman from the, the 24th is correct that you can't set a different legal standard um, for those two things. So uh, this, is, this is the most fair way to do it and it codifies the practice that is already happening that I believe was um, the result of a court case already. There was a challenge that was previously put up um, and the judge ruled that because of prior practice that this was the way that it should continue. So this just allows us to um, codify that in the ordinance so that it's clear going forward. Um, and if there are other election reforms, I, I think that we should look to those, uh, but I don't, I, I don't think that this gets in the way of looking towards further reforms. So, thank you. All, right. All the one from the 19th. So while we're talking, this 2% is much too low. It, it should be a minimum of 5%. Most people that go out to look for signatures, if they're known, if people want to support them, they're gonna sign for them and they can get probably more signatures that were even cast in the last uh, ward election. So when we make it too simple, too easy, it's, uh, it, it, it just, it doesn't lend any credibility to you need to work for it. So if I, if I had any say so, it would be 5%. Thank you. All of them from the first. So if we're really gonna talk since we're talking, no one has to run as an independent candidate, first of all, and especially if you're a democratic person who is a committee person. Now, the reason you do that when you sign up as a Democratic committee person, you agree that you're going to go by the rules. And the rules already say that you are a Democrat and that the Democrats will nominate who that person is. And the reason they let you do that is because the Democrats have already won that seat or the Republican as it be, because the Republicans also have a Republican, Democratic, um, Republican committee, not Democratic committee, here in the city of St. Louis. And if they want, they can nominate a Republican candidate. Okay. When you choose to run for an office after you have uh, said you will follow the democratic rules, that's because you choose to do that. You do not have to do that. You can wait until the next election. Okay. And in fact, when I was unceremoniously stripped of my voting rights and I became a committee person, I actually did pass a resolution saying that if you are a democratic committee person, and you run as in, uh, independent that we put you off of that Democratic committee. The same. And so that didn't happen to these people only because the people who were running it didn't know that I had passed that. But it sits right there. I have it on my desk right now, okay? And in fact, at the state level, they can put you off. So let's talk about the truth about 
uh, Democrats and Independent. What happens is you want to run anyway, and you don't want to follow the rules that were already set out, okay? So you change them because you say, I don't want to follow them. Okay, and that's fine, and you have a right to do that. If I had been on the Democratic Central Committee, and anybody did that, I would have voted to put them out right then and there, and then I would have raised hell with the uh, state party and said, and put them off the state party too, because you are now violating our rules. These are not, the, the Democratic Party is a private party, just like the Republican Party is. So what you want to do, you can't always do everything you want to do, okay? Just, and now, now you can get the rules changed, but the rules are very, very, uh, consistent in what they say, and they've been for a long time. And um, uh, to the point about independence, Kenny uh, Alderman from the former Alderman from the 22nd was independent for 16 years or something like that. Um, we had a Republican down here, um, Alderman Heidert from the 12th for I don't know 20 something years. So, but mostly we've had Democrats. And when they first come down here as an independent, let's just clear it up. They're not allowed to join any of the Democratic things, okay? You're not allowed to join the Democratic caucus. Now, some people say that's unfair. No, it isn't, because you, didn't, you are not a Democrat until you run and become a Democrat. And then you go to the bottom of the uh, uh, seniority because you were not a Democrat at the time you were here. Now, what I, I want to um, ask the alderman from uh, the 24th if he would yield, Mr. President. Alderman from the 24th, if he yield the question to the alderman from first. I will. Okay. Please proceed, Alderman. So really, um, Alderman, what you're really just trying to change, as I understand it, is that you're trying to change, uh, the words I saw was that you, you wanted to be a nominating petition signed by registered voters rather than a certificate signed by registered electors. Is that what you're doing? No, no, no. Um, with the Are we doing Bar Bill 146C? 146C, yes. Committee, yes, they say. Yes. Okay, right. Because it says here that you want to change uh, the the, Let's look at the bill, not the summary. Okay. The, the bill, I, I, I wouldn't put any faith in that summary. Yeah. Okay. The perfection book? Yeah. Okay. Maybe one of my good friends could, could dig up Bar Bill 146. Here, right here. I have put it up because. Okay. Okay. So what you want to do is what? Let me understand okay. it again. So right now, the, the part we're getting rid of is that, is that there is no clear standard within our law today for the number of signatures a candidate for alderman is supposed to get to get on the ballot. So it's not, it's vague. The law is vague, it is not specific. And the way that the Board of Elections has been interpreting the current vague law is that the standard is 2% of votes cast in the preceding mayoral election. And they've been applying that interpretation to candidates for aldermen, even though it's not, even though the language is vague. So what this bill is just trying to do is just to make that language specific so there's no room for interpretation on what the standard is. Okay, if I want to kind of add where they got that from, if you go into the charter when it talks about the recall of elected officials, so they kind of segue it a little bit, okay? The charter talks about if you do a citywide official, then it goes, but if you do a ward, then to be done from the ward. And they, seg they segued from that to do the same thing with the nominating process, correct? Yes. So okay. you're correct in the charter, there's two standards for recalls, which are specific to citywide and wards. So we're trying to make the process to get on the ballot specific to citywide and wards as well. And as I understand it right now, this is how, what they use, the 2%? They interpret, interpret the law currently. Now, I understand. Thank you. <laughs> OK. And so I understood the autumn from the 25th had some um, concerns because he said that um, there is a difference in voter turnout in the odd and the evens because who you run with. But as I understand it, this doesn't change any of this because that's the way they already do it anyway, right? So it, you, whoever ran, if you run in the odds, you will, and you run with the mayor, you will have a higher standard of if your ward is voting high during the mayoral election, unless there, the only way you wouldn't have a higher standard is, is uh, I guess if maybe you didn't have a, hmm, no, you would have a higher standard. So he was concerned that we try to make it even, but right now it's not even, is that correct? 
Well, I would, I would quibble with the idea that it's a different standard based on the ward. But it, I'm saying the numbers are different. It's proportional to right. what right. happened. It's just proportional to the votes cast in, in the last mayoral election, but it's one standard. And, and I would say that, you know, vote totals can, can vary a lot well, bear depending with me. on the ward. Yeah. It doesn't change because it goes to the mayoral election, that's what I was saying to you. So it doesn't, it's not about the alderman. It's just about what was cast in the last mayoral election. So my point to you is it does not change at all, okay? Yep. It is, if it's odd or even, I've been a odd, even first for many years, and now I'm a odd. The standard is still of the mayoral election. It just says who voted in your ward during that time. Is that not correct? Exactly, yes. Okay. And can I ask, do you know, um, besides the fact that I know that the alderman from the seventh is friends with the people over at the board of election, why, why are we doing this now? Well, so they, I, I think um, a couple reasons. So there's, there's four bills that each are a little different, right? They, there, there was, in the first one, clarifying who you make the check out to and where you take the check. People have questioned that in recent history, in the last mayoral election. So they said, let's fix that. Then they said, let's look at this other stuff. That people who is that? The Board of Elections. So they requested these changes? Yes. From the commissioners or the uh, Democratic head or Republican head? Who, do you know who requested it? I don't know exactly where that conversation uh, started, but the, the, the Gary Stoff is the Republican um, I know who appointee. he is. Yeah, he, he was His the brother one was a Democratic state rep. Explained, explained most of the rationale for these changes in, in committee. So the Republican commissioner explained the rationale, not the Democratic commissioner. Sure, but I think most of us have found him to be a reliable interpreter of, uh, of the laws over That's, the years. Hold that opinion for yourself. I've dealt with him a lot longer than you, okay? So that is your opinion. <laughs> Uh, so that is not, he, he, he plays partisan politics, okay. Um, but so, um, but basically you're just changing this to reflect what we are already doing. Yes. Thank you. Alderman from the 25th. Thank you, Mr. President. Um, I just, I, I want to rise again because uh, I, I would like to have an opportunity to have a broader discussion with regards to how we administer elections in the city of St. Louis. Um, I get that the crux of this bill is to codify a practice that's been in place for a while now, but since we're now taking the time to address and codify this issue, I think we need to have a broader conversation with regard to the issue itself. You know, I, I mean, I'm all about, you know, election reform and trying to make sure that, you know, our elections are accessible and easy for folks, but they also need to be fair to the candidates. And in, in, in this particular situation, we're not talking about just special elections. We're talking about general elections across the board, right? And in general elections, there's a primary and then there's a general election and the primary determines who the Republican and the Democratic candidates and Green Party, Libertarian, et cetera, are going to be. And then the general election is when you can file for an independent candidacy and run. And your independent candidacy is based off of the number of signatures that you can collect with an award based off of the previous mayoral election. That being the case, you know, in a regular election cycle, and I'm going to use the 20th ward, my neighboring ward as an example, you know, if you run for alderman in the 20th ward, you know, this coming election cycle, you only need to gather 21 signatures in order to be on the ballot. If you were the Democrat running to earn your place on that general election ballot in a normal election cycle, you have to go out and earn 300 votes. So you're giving the same equivalency as 300 votes to be a Democrat on that ballot that you have to go out and campaign and earn those votes to 20 people, 21 people, you know, who signed a petition in order to get someone onto a ballot. You know, I certainly can appreciate 
in a special election cycle where the Democratic and Republican candidates are predetermined by committee people, that this is a, you know, certainly something that we need to you know, cast some light on and have a discussion about and you know, modify our practices for sure. But this is not what that bill does. This bill is talking about any and every general election cycle, any and every general election cycle, so if you have a Republican and a Democrat going out, raising money, knocking doors, having conversations with neighbors, showing up at meetings, running an aggressive campaign during a primary, and they have to earn hundreds and hundreds of votes in order to be on that general election ballot, and then someone who's running as an independent simply needs to go out and get 2% of the votes in order to be on that ballot, that's hardly fair. That is hardly fair. And I know that that's, that is the practice that we have currently. You know, so I'm not, I, I get that, that the bill this, that we're discussing right now is just codifying what we currently use as a practice. But it's an unfair practice. You know, I think that we need to look at how we're handling and administering special elections as it, as it applies to you know, independent candidates specifically, because we do not have a very open primary, we don't have a primary process for you know, really Democrats or, or um, Republicans in that situation. Um, but this is something that we're talking about as a matter of fact across the board with any general election. And so I think if we're having that conversation, then let's have that conversation and I think it's appropriate that we, you know, either amend the bill to address those situations, you know, or vote no. All right. Thank you. All right. Uh, alderman from the um, 24th, in absence of the alderman from the 7th, would you like to place Board Bill 146 Committee Substitute as amended on the informal calendar? I might do that in a minute. But right. first I'm going to say <laughs> I am... Uh, I am shocked to hear these arguments that we want to make it harder for people to get on the ballot. I am absolutely shocked. Uh, it, is a, it, is a, it is a small d democratic value to have competitive elections to give people a choice in who they elect. And the fact is there are certain circumstances where uh, making sure independents can get on the ballot facilitates people having a real choice in who they elect. And that is an unequivocally good thing. And if people want to stand up here and argue that it ought to be hard, we ought to have less competitive elections and we ought to make it harder for people to get on the ballot, uh, go for it. Let's, ma let's make those arguments and let's see, let's debate what the standard ought to be. Um, I have to say, you know, running as an independent, uh, all, you have to do to, all you have to do to file under a party name is pay your filing fee. You're running as an independent, you gotta pay your filing fee and you gotta get signatures, all right? Uh, so I would, I would dispute the fact that the standard is somehow uh, higher for, for candidates running under a, a party banner. Second of all, we have, people, we have people who file all the time under you know, these random parties, green parties, libertarian, they do nothing, they get four votes. Let's look at the results of when people filed as independents and ran for office. They won time and time again. So, Maybe we ought to respect the idea that allowing independence on the ballot and giving people a choice is in fact a good thing. The idea that, that it's unfair to independence that we're placing Democrats at some type of disadvantage when every single member of this body and 99.5% of the members of this body for the last 40 years have been Democrats is an absurd, an absurd argument that Democrats are at a disadvantage. It's absurd. If we want to change the standard, I, I don't disagree, maybe the standard should be 4%, maybe it should be 5%, but we talked about this in, in committee, right? And in committee, we said, uh, let's not jump ahead and make it harder for people to get on the ballot by changing this number, right? If we want to debate what the number should be or we want to look at how other places do it, sure. But the only point of this bill was to clarify what was unclear in the law, right? So we don't end up in a situation where we don't know if somebody should be on the ballot. That's not good for you know, faith in local elections. So I'm gonna, I'm gonna request that Board Bill 146, Committee Substitute as Amendment goes on the informal perfection calendar for now. Thank you. Madam Clerk, please make note of that. Place Board Bill 146, Committee Substitute as Amended on the perfection informal calendar. 
So noted. Board Bill 147. Sponsored by Alderman Kotor and Ordinance Revising Section 1B1 of Ordinance Number 59982, approved July 31st, 1986, codified as Section 208400B1 of the C City of St. Louis Revised Code of Ordinances, pertaining to the last date on which a candidate may withdraw from a primary election from 40 days prior to the date of primary election to 50 days prior to the date of primary election and containing an emergency clause. Alderman, Alderman from the 24th, you recognize on the perfection of Board Bill 147. Thank you, Mr. President. I move we perfect Board Bill 147. Moved by the Alderman from the 24th, entertain a second on that motion. Seconded by the Alderman from the 8th. Alderman from the 24th, please proceed. Thank you. Um, we'll see if this one's simpler or not. I don't know. Uh, this, this changes the number of days, Board Bill 147 changes the number of days uh, prior to the election date where a candidate can remove themselves from the ballot. So as we all know, there is a filing period where you, are, you can file, put your name on the ballot uh, to run for office, and then there's a period after the filing period where you can subsequently remove your name from the ballot uh, before, you know, before the election happens. The issue right, right now is that so we want to we want to say 50 days out from the election is from the actual election is when you need to remove your name from the ballot if you want to be off the ballot rather than 40 days because there's a couple days in there where the election board is finalizing the ballots, and then they have a weird situation where a candidate wants their name off the ballot, but they have no choice but to put their name on the ballot. And that can lead to a bad situation where <laughs> somebody who doesn't want their name on the ballot is still on the ballot as it goes out and you know, voters see it. So that is, that is all, this, um, all this one fixes. Any further discussion? Any further discussion? All of all of them from the first, <laughs> and you're next. All of them from the fourth. You, you, <laughs> Do you I, I'll yield. I've had much more time. All, than all of them from the fourth. <laughs> Thank you, Mr. President. I just want to ask a question. At all of them from the twenty-fourth. If these bills are so good, why aren't you co-sponsoring them? And all of them from the twenty-fourth. We yield for questions to the all of them from the fourth. Yes. All of them um, for the fourth. Please proceed. I just wanted to know why you're not co-sponsoring the bills, why your name is not on them. Uh, uh, Mr. President, Clerk, I, I request my name be added as a co-sponsor to Board Bills 144, 145, 146, and 147. Thank you. Madam Clerk, please make note of that change. So noted. Alderman, Alderman from the first. Um, Mr. President, members of the board, um, if the Alderman from the 24th would yield. Alderman from the 24th would yield to the Alderman from the first. Yes. I actually think this is good. I don't think it goes for, for, far enough because do you know when the ballots are printed? Well, I didn't know the alderman from the 7th <laughs> wasn't going to be here today. So I would have, I would have set out, I would have had this timeline down so I could, um, so I could share that exact number with you. But I, but I, I hope that you know and we can, we can talk uh, what, about What I'm saying is this will be better, but the yeah. ballots will still be printed. And so um, I would love for us to just hold this and make this so that we find out exactly when the ballots are printed and make it that day. Because I do think that's wrong um, when people are still on the ballot and they've tried to withdraw and then people have voted for them absentee. But I don't think this gets to it. I don't think this one is actually far enough, okay? So I'm not opposed to it, but why make it 50 if that's still going to leave you on the ballot? It has to be the time, I think, that before they print the ballot. Do you understand what I'm saying? Well, I, so I'm going by memory here, but I, I think uh, Did combat pay for this? It's like, it's like the Monday of six weeks before the election, which is normally like 43 or 44 days. So it's something like that. So pushing it out to 50 days. It gets it? Gets it, yeah. Gets us can out I of trust that, you to the, the, window. Can I trust you that that's true? Yeah, <laughs> yeah I, I've hit, I've hit my head a lot over the years, so I don't put 100% faith in my memory. Okay. Um, but, but like I said, mine is not, I agree with 
this. I just hadn't looked it up, like I said before, because Annie had told me, I'm sorry, the older woman from the agency said we were going to put them on the informal, because I would have looked it up, because I don't want us to put a date, and then we have to come back here and change it. So I'm just going to look up when, when they print the ballots now, or if it's in here. Let's find it out. Let's find, okay. let's find out the real, uh, the real timeline. Because that's what we should be Okay, but what's Bosley's number? Alderman from the 25th. Thank you, Mr. President. I, is it my understanding that you're going to ask that this be sent back to committee or put on the informal? You're going to put it on the informal, or we're just giving her time to... We're just coming up with the uh, coming up with the actual timelines. Yeah. Okay, so uh, I I think that this is a you know interesting board bill myself. Um, you know we do have a fairly short election cycle at this in the city of St. Louis. Generally, filing opens sometime around you know Thanksgiving, closes sometime around New Year's, uh, and then you have about three months once filing closes to actually campaign for office. Um, you know, we are all committing to, well, I shouldn't say all of us, those of us that are, you know, filing during a normal election cycle are committing to a four-year term, you know, to the city of St. Louis. We're giving up four years of our lives to, you know, be public servants uh, down here at City Hall and in our neighborhoods. Um, so, you know, it, it's always been curious to me how someone can make a decision to sign up for public office and commit four years of their life but can't seem to make it through three months before wanting to pull their name off of a ballot. Um, it doesn't exactly show good judgment in my, you know, in my estimation. Um, so I, I am curious to see, you know, how we're going to work out the specific times. I, I think the older woman from the first ward really addressed, you know, my concern in terms of, you know, having the dates reflect when the ballots actually get printed. Um, but I, I always thought that that was a very interesting thing. If someone is willing to sign up and put four years of their life on the line, uh, and public service, but uh, somehow decides to change that. Uh, and I, life circumstances being what they are, uh, you know, notwithstanding, but it's, uh, you know, certainly an interesting thing that happens from time to time. Um, but I would like to make sure that we're, you know, making this aligned with whenever ballots get printed by the BOE, especially, particularly absentee ballots as well. Uh, Alderman from the 22nd is recognized. Thank you, Mr. Um, President and members of the board. I, I want to kind of address um, a concern that the Alderman from the 25th had in reference of withdrawing. Many people probably don't remember. The first time I filed for election, I filed for record of deeds in 2002. And then I heard my Alderman was resigning. And I thought, wow, I would probably much rather serve my community as alderman then be recorder of deeds. So I had to withdraw from the recorder of deeds race. And then I had to collect signatures and file as an independent candidate in a special election. So I've gone the gamut of some of the conversation that we're having down here today and can appreciate all of it. So to my colleague of the 25th, sometimes there is really a good reason to withdraw your name and your circumstance just happen to pop up where you may feel that you have a better opportunity, or maybe you've been given a nice job opportunity and decide, hey, I'd rather have that six-figure income than to run for public office and be subjected to all the nuances of negative campaigning. Thank you, Mr. President. Are there any other comments on board bill number 147? Uh, Alderman from the twenty. Alderman from the twenty-first. Uh, I don't believe has spoken yet. Alderman. I, I, I yield to the alderman from the twenty-fifth. Alderman from the twenty-fifth. Thank you, Mr. President. I just uh, wanted to make the remark that I would have uh, gladly seen you run for the recorder of deeds office and would have supported you for that election at that point in time. <laughs> alderman from the twenty-first. Uh, thank you, Mr. Vice President. Uh, Alderman from the 22nd, if I was able to vote, I would have voted for you too. I was still in elementary school in 2002. <laughs> uh, 
Uh, <laughs> with the alderman from the 24th, please yield for question. Uh, alderman, why, why are we extending the period instead of shortening it up? In my belief, uh, we are allowing candidates who want to run to play with voters, and, re and we are extending the time for them to withdraw from a race instead of voters having a real uh, uh, opportunity to choose an alderman and, 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 um, and actually get a plan from that particular yeah. alderman or that particular candidate. But we're allowing a person who is running to run for, four, for 10 more days. Uh, we're extending that period. And no, so we're, we're, we are shortening the withdrawal period, right? So you have to count, you count back from the election date and right now, you can, you can withdraw 40, 40 days before the election date. And we're saying you're going to have to withdraw 50 days before the election date. And so I was just speaking to the alderman, alderman from the first. And we got some clarification that the absentee ballots have to be available um, in this period where candidates can still withdraw. So we've had cases where people come in, they vote on an absentee ballot for a candidate who then three days later withdraws from, withdraws from the race. So we're trying to prevent that from happening. So when the absentee ballots are available, the candidate list is set. So we're shortening the period where people can withdraw so that that period ends before the first day where people can take an absentee ballot and cast an absentee ballot. That, I thank the alderman from the first because because uh, that helps that helped me clarify exactly why we were um, doing this change. Got it. So, so when absentee ballots are printed, the candidate who who wants to withdraw his or her name would not be on the absentee ballot. Correct. So t today they can withdraw after that absentee ballot is printed. With this change, they would be forced to withdraw before the first day that the absentee ballots are, are available. Correct. Uh, thank, thank you, Alderman. Are there any other comments on board bill number 147? Alderman from the third is recognized for the first time. Thank you. Um, I, I appreciate the intent. Um, I kind of think long term on things. Uh, Sometimes I just kind of try to play out every scenario that can possibly happen um, for you know that that create a, that can create a circumstance like this. You know, you know, in which this could be uh, hurtful or unhelpful. Um, we most certainly want um, people who want to commit to office to you know, have the chance to be on the ballot and withdraw from the ballot at the time, you know, at, at an adequate time. I, I think it, it it's, it's, it's a weird way of thinking, but it's, you know, sometimes the way that I think. In terms of competition, right, it's, which is something we all run into when we are running for office. A lot of times you have a lot of competition. And I think when you get down to um, those last few weeks within a race, you really start to get an idea of where candidates are, what your probabilities of winning are, what your probabilities of losing are, who can lose what. Those are the times that are very critical for not only the voters, but the people who are running for office, right? So you get 40 days out once again, um, you know, kind of to touch up on uh, Ottoman from the 22nd. If you get um, you know, enough people to support you, and you know, hypothetically speaking, you get a job opportunity based on the race that you've run, and you think that that job would be, you know, you would serve your community better doing that particular job, or you know, uh, you know, if your personal interest is there, um, still in mind with the community, because of course that's, you know, I think where the job offer would be coming from. Um, I, I, I don't think there's an, an issue with that. Number one, and not even just that in particular. Um, I mean, we're talking ten days, and even, you know, if if you don't want to be on the ballot, I, I think you would know before those 10 days uh, get there. It, I don't think we've had a big issue with it thus far. It's not a lot of voters complaining about it. And I also don't like the fact that we got a lot of different things about changing the election, you know, you know, consecutively right in front of us. Um, no, once again, disrespect to you. 
Scott, um, these things haven't been brought forth by the people in the board. This is coming from who? The uh, Board of Commissioners? Board of Elections. Um, I always feel like in the future there are plans for all of us. You know, and there are people that are planning for things that could possibly happen, and we aren't planning ourselves. I don't know how this can affect us in the future, um, but I, I don't think right now when voters are very confused about a lot of the things that we're doing in the Board of Aldermen that we need to create more confusion amongst them with changing things and dealings with the way these elections are handled. So I just wanted to put that out there. Thank you. Alderwoman from the first is recognized. President, members of the board. Um, so um, if the alderman from the 24th yield. Is this, okay. I'm sorry. I asked if the alderman from the 24th would yield. Would you yield? Yes. Yeah. Um, so let's just take a real day experience, okay, so we can try to make people. Mm -hmm. So uh, we have an election coming up on 3-5-19. Is that correct? Correct. Okay. And um, so what you're, right now, the way we have it, um, if we were having 40 days before the election, that would be, uh, that you would have to withdraw, that would be January 26, 2019. That would be 40 days. Correct. However, absentee voting begins January 22nd. Exactly. So that means that, I I'm going to help you out here. <laughs> okay. That means that we would have already printed up the ballots and sent them out and people could have voted, and then um, people could still legally withdraw. Exactly. Okay, so if you're saying if we move it back 10 days from uh, January the 26th to, um, what is 10 days? Okay, I, didn't, I, I wrote it down here someplace. 10 more days, it'd be... Uh, 16th. Uh, yes. Then we would have, thank you. I'm, I gotta go someplace and I'm running late. Oof. Then if we went back to that, that would be before absentee voting started. But what I'm saying, to the 16th, and, and voting starts on the 22nd, which is to my point, we still would have had to print those ballots up. And that's why I'm saying I don't think we quite get there. We're doing better, but you understand what I'm saying? And if could we just wait another week and try to figure out the exact dates, so, or can we amend this so that we have enough, so we actually do what you're trying to do? Um. That's fine. Do you want it? Do you want to amend I, I, it? I right work now? with you. I commit to you. I'm, I, I'm, yeah. I, I agree with you. Okay, that's not fair to people. Sure. Okay. Uh, well, when I have the floor, I'll. I'll... Oh. <laughs> Mr. President, I have no further questions. Alderman from the 24th. Um, two out of four is going to have to do for today. But uh, two heads were better than one here. I thank the Alderman from the first for clarifying this. Just to be clear, that is the issue. It's the first day of absentee voting, and the first day of absentee voting is determined by state law. We can't change that, but our local law determines when candidates can withdraw. So we've had situations where somebody votes on an absentee ballot on the first or second day that are available, and then the candidate withdraws, and they have voted for somebody who ultimately was not on the ballot, and they've cast a ballot, and you can't undo that, and that's not a good thing. So that's the problem we're trying to fix. Um, if we want to clarify, uh, you know, do we need to go a couple more days to shorten that period even further? That's fine. So I will request that we put Board Bill 147 on the informal perfection calendar. Thank you. Madam Clerk, please place Board Bill number 147 on the informal calendar. The Alderman from the third ward is recognized uh, for the purpose of suspending uh, the rules to, uh, for Board Bill number 149. Alderman? Yes, sir. Um, I'd like to, thank you, Mr. President. I'd like to suspend the rules to place Board Bill 149 on third reading calendar, third reading consent. Sorry. Second. It was seconded by the Alderman from the 22nd. Any discussion? Hearing no discussion, Madam Clerk, please call the roll. Alderwoman Tyus? Aye. Alderwoman Middlebrook? Alderman Bosley? Alderman, excuse me, Alderman Moore. Aye. Alderman Hubbard. Aye. Alderman Ingracia. Aye. Alderman Kotar. 
Alderwoman Rice? Aye. Alderman Gunther? Aye. Alderman Vollmer? Aye. Alderwoman Martin? Aye. Alderman Ornowitz? Alderwoman, Alderwoman Murphy? Aye. Alderwoman Howard? Alderwoman Green? Alderman Odenberg? Alderman Rohde? Aye. Alderman Kennedy? Alderman Davis? Alderman Spencer? Alderman Muhammad? Alderman Boyd? Aye. Alderman Vaccaro? Alderman Ogilvy? Aye. Alderman Cone? Alderman Williamson? Alderman Boyd? Alderwoman Navarro, President Reed, Alderwoman Middlebrook, Alderman Coltar, Alderwoman Howard, Alderman Kennedy, Alderwoman Spencer, Alderman Muhammad, Alderman Vaccaro, Alderman Cohn, Alderwoman Navarro, President Reed, 20 I votes. Sorry. Um, by your vote, you have uh, sustained the uh, motion of the alderman from the third third reading consent calendar. That is the extent of board bills for perfection. Third reading consent. Board bill one zero eight. Board bill one twenty eight. Board bill one thirty four as amended. Board bill one thirty five as amended. Board Bill 120, gotcha. Board Bill 121, and Board Bill 149. Yeah. Well, Alderman, from the 22nd, you're recognized, third reading consent calendar. Move to pass all bills read on a third reading consent calendar. Second. It's moved by the Alderman from the 22nd, seconded by the Alderman from the 10th. All those in favor, say aye. Madam Clerk, we have to no. do this by roll, uh, roll call. Matt. Previous aye. roll. No objection to the previous roll. We will cons consider the third reading consent calendar passed. Um, um, we'll dispense with our line item number 18, line item 19, report of the enrollment committee. Board Bill 108, 128, 134 as amended, 135 as amended, 120, 121, and Board Bill 149. That is the extended report of enrollment committee. All other, being, uh, all other business being suspended, the president shall in open session affix the signature so that the end these bills may become law.
Agenda item number 20, courtesy resolutions. Alderwoman from 19th, do you recognize your courtesy resolutions? I move that we adopt our courtesy resolution consent calendar. Second. Moved and seconded by the alderwoman from the um, 19th. All those in favor say aye. Do we need to do a roll call vote on this? Or? No. Uh, we you. dispense with line items number 21, 22, 23. Announcements. For Wednesday, November 14th, Health and Human Services meeting is 10 a.m. in the leisure room. Friday, November 16th, 2018, full board meeting, 10 a.m. in the chambers. That's, that is the extent of the announcements. Any other alderman from the six to recognize for announcements? Mr. President, members of the board, I uh, just wanted to remind folks that we are going to head to the water treatment facility plant um, up on Chain of Rocks this afternoon. We will modify the time to make sure people can get back in time, um, or you are welcome to drive yourself and follow the shuttle up there. So we'll leave right after the board meeting. Other announcements? Alderwoman from the 13th. President, members of the board, I would wanted to have as my honored guest, I wanted to introduce uh, the new um, assessor, Mike Dolphin. He is a constituent of mine, and I do believe I was at his eighth grade graduation. But <laughs> Any other announcements? Uh, Alderman from the 22nd. Yes, Mr. President. Um, First of all, I want to salute our veterans. Veterans Day coming up uh, tomorrow will be a Veterans Day parade. Just want to give you an itinerary for tomorrow. Um, at 8 o'clock, there's a flag raising ceremony. At 8.30, there's a St. Patrick's Veterans Day 5K starting on Market Street. At 10 o'clock, the 35th Annual St. Louis Regional Veterans Day Observance and Welcome Home Ceremony. 11 to 1 p.m., U.S. Postal Service stamp cancellation commemorating the 100th anniversary of the armistice and from at 12 o'clock the 35th annual veterans day parade so that's all happening tomorrow downtown so I'd like to encourage everybody to come out whoever so will thank you um okay uh excused alderman the alderman from the 22nd is recognized I move to excuse the alderman from the 7th, 23rd, and 28th due to necessary absence. Been moved and seconded. All those in favor, aye. Aye. Those opposed? Ayes have it. Alderman from the 22nd, you're recognized for the adjournment motion. Thank you, Mr. President, members of the board. I move that we adjourn until next Friday, November the 16th. All those in favor? Opposed? Meeting adjourned.